Good afternoon to all. Uh, so my name is Marilyn Fieschi. I'm the Managing Director of Science Business. That some of you may know, it's a news uh, and communications company specialized in EU research and innovation policies. And it's my pleasure uh, to be here today and to welcome all of you for this afternoon session. But we're going to spend the afternoon together with a few more people, as you can figure out. Uh, but before we deep dive again uh, in the world of ultra small and quantum magic, um, is there a better way to start an afternoon conference than with music? So this is the Viennese signature of a conference, music at, at a conference. So this is my pleasure to introduce, new, to, to introduce Dick New Schneeberger Trio. Uh, that is going to perform for you a very authentic, if, as I was informed, uh, and very well-known Viennese music. Please welcome the Dignus Schnellberger Trio.
Fantastic. Thank you. The good news is that they are staying here and we'll have more musical interlude uh, a bit later. But it's now the time for an official welcome by the Austrian presidency. And I believe there is a short movie, um, short film that uh, would be uh, showed. And then I will ask Minister Fassmann, so Federal Minister uh, for Education, Science and, Re and Research to come up on stage for opening remarks. So can we have the film launched? To achieve something great, it needs talent in every country. Challenges need to be faced. Pioneers working hard to perform best. They never give up. Because there are others who do the same. And if they play together, everything is possible. We stand up against global warming. Defeat hunger. Advanced technologies to improve our lives and empower the talents of tomorrow. Together, we play a powerful symphony that is going to change the world. So let's advance Europe. Together. Minister Fassmann. <coughs> Excellencies. Excellencies distinguished guests, dear fans of Schrödinger's cat. Um, as the Austrian presidency of the Council um, of the European Union, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to welcome um, the quantum scientist Schrödinger's cats and so many of my colleagues from politics at this remarkable event. I think it was organized uh, by a group of quantum enthusiasts around Professor Frank Wilhelm Mauch and Professor Tommaso Calarco. It is sponsored by the European Commission and co-organized by quantum fans of the Austrian Federal Ministry of Education, Science and Research. Mr. Veselka, are you a member of that group? And you are a quantum fan as well? Um, after the Quantum Europe Conference in Amsterdam 2016, and Malta 2017, Austria is really honored to kick off today the quantum flagship in Vienna during our presidency. I hope that you will enjoy your stay here in Vienna and Austria, a country full of history and tradition and music, um, as all uh, can be seen at our conference location here at the Imperial Palace. For over 600 years, this was the residence of the Austrian emperors. The Habsburgs reigned from the 13th century until the end of the monarchy, and it was 1918. Many of you know Austria as a country of culture, of music, of art, of Beethoven, Mozart, Klimt, and Schiele, but Austria is also a country of science and research, technology, and innovation. Austria has a rich and diverse higher education research and innovation landscape with 22 public universities, 21 universities of applied 
Sciences and 13 smaller private ones. And we have the Austrian Academy of Science, whose president is Anton Teilinger, um, as a person, I would say, is not unknown here in that audience. Um, the Austrian Academy of Science is the largest non-university research institution um, and a big player in quantum physics. May I remind you, by the way, that Schrodinger's cat was invented here and is still around as we will see today. A remarkable thing for a cat aged 83 years. Another important non-university research institute I have to address is the Institute of Science and Technology, which was established 2006 and modeled after the Weizmann Institute. Um, the East, the East Austria, did not invent Schrödinger's cat, but is the most successful organization in Europe regarding ERC grants, with almost 48% of grants approved. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> Since 2005, Austria has more than doubled its research expenditure and increased its, its, its R&D intensity from 2.4% to 3.2% of the GDP. Our target is 3.8% of the GDP by 2020. Our current, ER, uh, our current research and development rate of 3.2 is the second highest in the EU after Sweden and the seventh um, highest worldwide. So Austria is not only a country of music, art, um, it's also a country of science and research. And you should not forget Austria was the birthplace of Schrodinger's cat. The challenge that Austria has, as smaller countries do, is priority setting. Really difficult to set priorities and build up critical mass. But this is not the case in quantum physics. Here we started to invest more than 30 years ago and we are, I hope so, a relevant and visible player in the field. To cut a long story short, I would say it goes back to the 70s when Professor Rauch made exciting neutron experiments and later his student, student Professor Zeilinger, put the dreams of a TV series named Star Trek on a real basis in physics when he achieved the first realization of quantum teleportation of an independent qubit in 1997, uh, 1979. Um, regrettable, almost 20 years later, I had to learn that we are still very, very long away from teleporting macroscopic objects or even human beings, um, say from Vienna to Brussels, without needing boring airports and security checks. It is the nature of science and research to investigate on the forefront and to develop technologies further and further. New findings and rapid technological developments create a constant interest within the scientific community to establish new cutting-edge tools and to continuously upgrade existing ones. Regarding Schrödinger's cat, I can assure that we are working on an equivalent Gedankenexperiment which, save, which saves the cat's life and the life of the physicist when being watched by cat fans on YouTube. The quantum technologies flagship is another very fine example of that approach. It is a successful instrument um, for the medium and long-term exploitation of, innov of innovative Europe research, and I'm sure that it will do um, the job also for quantum technologies. The vision is to build a quantum a web that connects and uses quantum computers, quantum simulators, and quantum sensors in the sense of a quantum internet. Mr. Spock from Star Trek would say just one word, fascinating. Much of the scientific base has been created 
in recent decades in Europe. Austria has contributed significantly in some areas, in particular pioneer research in quantum communication, teleportation, cryptography, and quantum computers. As all national budgets are limited, resources have to be invested in a strategic way. Here also comes the European dimension in place. In Horizon 2020, the European Commission has a special program for special initiatives called FAT flagships. The next framework program, Horizon Europe, takes a new approach called mission-orientated research. Last week, um, the ministers in charge um, of research discussed the Commission's proposals for five areas of missions and areas for institutionalized partnerships at an informal lunch in Brussels. You know that one of these missions proposed is, I, I, I quote, to build the first universal quantum computer in Europe. The first areas of mission will be negotiated among the member states during the next weeks in the research working groups in Brussels. And depending on these negotiations, the Competitiveness Council on 30 of November might agree um, on the list of mission areas or might not agree. Nobody can predict. Um, whereas the first universal quantum computer being built in Europe would be like the shot um, to the moon, but we all know that we need powerful rockets to do so. Therefore, the FED flagship rests on several equally important building blocks, such quantum communication and cryptography, which will also need to be further explored for Europe's global competitiveness. Let me give, if I have the time, um, a short glimpse on the Austrian situation. The Austrian program Quantum Research and Technology initiated, initiated in 2017 by my ministry is run by the FFG and the Austrian um, Science Fund. Um, in April 2018, the program launched successfully its first national call with a total budget of 5.6 million euro. The evaluation results are available, are available by November 2018. The program grants funding for exploratory and cooperative um, research and development projects of Austrian companies, research institutes, universities, and other stakeholders being active in the field of quantum information, um, communication, science, and technologies. International partners are welcome to join the Austrian Research and Development Consortia. The second national call um, and the participation in the next Quant Era call are planned for 2019. Back in Europe, someone, maybe the media, if the medias are represented here, will ask um, me or you if an overall investment in the flagship in, in the order of 1 billion euro is not too much and if we should not use the money for something else. I would say definitely no. Um, what is behind the moon can only, be, can only be answered if one looks behind the moon. When competing with China or the US, it is important to join forces and very large technology, highly complex research and tech development can best be established when expertise is pooled and costs are, chair, are shared jointly in a transnational context. This is what we politicians call European added value. But we have to explain the people um, in simple words and without the necessity of a four semester course in quantum mechanics, why society needs quantum computing quantum sensors, quantum simulation, and quantum communication. We also have to include, um, up to a certain step, um, humanities and social science in, in this, as the outcome of the research is important for all of us. And we have to address ethical questions in a systematic, systematic and comprehensive way. Let me end 
by wishing you all an enriching stay here in Austria, both on professional and personal level. I look forward to stimulating debates. Let me remind you once again to the motto of the Austrian presidency in research and in the movie, advance Europe together. And last but not least, live longer and prosper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Fassmann. And in fact, you will come back after, um, in, a, in a little while, back on stage, so we'll have the opportunity to go deeper into what Austria is doing in the field of quantum technology. It is time for another uh, music break. So the next song was written by Dickno and his teacher, Martin Spitzer. It is devoted to the city of Vienna. So stretch your legs, relax, and enjoy Swing the Vienne. So I'd like now to, to welcome our next speaker, the man in charge at the European Commission, uh, Roberto Viola, Director General at DigiConnect, European Commission, to officially launch the Quantum Flagship. Mr. Viola. The uh, Minister Fassmann, uh, dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's for me really an, an emotion, first of all, to be here, and a pleasure. And, you know, it's really for us a great pleasure to probably host you here, uh, talking about probability of being in one place and this Schrodinger cat. And thank you to the Austrian presidency for having 
organized this event with us and for hosting us here. Here, uh, it's also, I noticed near the Schatzkammer, the treasury chamber. And here we are actually presenting one of the jewels of uh, European research and technology efforts, this quantum flagship. You know, when I, when I travel the world uh, and we have uh, this bilateral uh, with uh, many countries, and there's a long list of things we say and uh, exchange, when I start uh, presenting the quantum flagship, people stop looking at the smartphones and start to listen. Uh, and this is very telling uh, because I think uh, we have collectively, although we are just the beginning of this good story, we have done something very special. And uh, we, have, we have seen all over the world as one example of doing things well and together. So well done. Well done to the community, which is really working hard to put together this flagship that represents the academia, industry, and all the stakeholders. Well done to the member states that have uh, worked together with the Commission to do this uh, in such a short time. And if you allow me, well done to my team that has really worked day and night uh, to make it possible. So today is a day of celebration, but also is the day of the start where we see uh, where we can go uh, and probably sky as or the universe talking about quantum has no limits. Minister Fassman, rightly so, said uh, we have to explain to the citizens why it's relevant. I completely agree. Uh, let me try, uh, of course, the real answer has to come from the flagship, but let me try just in few words to, to share with you what are my thoughts about this. Well, first of all, uh, everyone is uh, used uh, and actually uses quantum 1.0, lasers. I mean, uh, think about uh, medicine, modern medicine without lasers. So people already use the benefits of quantum physics. But when it comes to quantum 0.0, the one we are kicking off today, there are many things that will, will change. Well, of course, the most glamorous one is the quantum computer that maybe will be in the pocket of our nephews or, uh, or who knows when, but it will come. And someone will say uh, quantum computers have changed the world. Whoever will arrive to this point, and we do dream that Europe will arrive first, will have really, we unlock the power of computing of the world to solve problems that today we cannot solve, to cure illnesses that today we cannot cure. One example above all, uh, you know that uh, we have uh, already two flagships. One is the graphene and the other is the brain flagship. In the brain project, the ambition at the very beginning was to completely map the human brain, to be able to simulate the human brain to understand it better, how it functions and also how to cure chronic diseases. You know what is the most important challenge of that project? Computational power. It is not possible today to have enough computational power to understand how many cells uh, we have in the brain and how they function. So uh, this is just one example where, I mean, uh, really, uh, uh, for the problems of today's uh, citizens, I mean, not the citizens in 300 years from now, quantum technologies can be very relevant. The same applies to sensors. Uh, with quantum sensors, we can detect uh, uh, even uh, micro uh, uh, flux of uh, blood or micro changes, even at subcellular level. This means that we can predict uh, uh, much, much uh, quicker than today the onset of every uh, uh, different changes in the cell behavior which means, of course, uh, as you can imagine, early detection of very, very serious illnesses. And the list is long. Think about time distribution. Uh, uh, probably you know that, I mean, the navigation system that you use every day, uh, the, the clock uh, is an atomic clock. It's a first generation clock, uh, but now they are becoming more precise, more stable, to the point that uh, they will be 
become smaller and smaller, thanks to the advancement of quantum technology, and being everywhere in a way that, I mean, every financial transaction will be timestamped with an atomic clock. And the old system will become much more precise than today. And what about uh, encryption? Everything in our life is becoming digital these days. Uh, healthcare, uh, transport, uh, financial transaction, uh, fundamental uh, issues such as production and control of production of everything is digitized. So an attack, a malicious attack to our system could destabilize our society, our civilization. That's why we have to encrypt the data, protect under uh, uh, all possible circumstances of an attack. And maybe in the future, also the attack uh, will have uh, the power of quantum technologies. So we have to develop an encryption system, an encryption technology that can resist a quantum attack. But to do that, we need to simulate it. So we need a quantum simulator to, in order to understand how to design the next encryption system. And also, uh, through quantum uh, uh, key distribution, so uh, encryption that can be really, I mean, at the level of a photon, we can be extremely uh, secure, and extremely precise in encrypting our, the information we send around, what we call, in a way, the internet of quantum. So all these are things that everyday citizens understand, because it's about the security, it's about healthcare, about uh, better quality of life. And this is the promise of this flagship, which, allow me to say, is not really insignificant. It's really a shaping flagship for the future. That's why it deserves an important place in the future Horizon Europe program, but not only. What the Commission uh, has try to do with this, uh, the new multi-annual financial framework is not only to give uh, an house to the future R&D of Europe, but also to think about uh, what can be applied uh, progressively as the evolution allows for it. So we have two twin programs. And we have uh, the Horizon Europe, which of course will continue working. So what we do now in the flagship will continue in Horizon Europe. And then we have the Digital Europe program, where we want to do advanced high-performance computing, advanced uh, cybersecurity, advanced artificial intelligence. Now, I know that uh, our documents are not exactly bedtime, bedtime reading, so I expect that you have not read much about those uh, plans. But maybe if you have a minute, uh, read, for instance, what we want to do in the Digital Europe program. In the Digital Europe program, we have the ambition, once the flagship will advance, to create uh, the first uh, pre-operational quantum key distribution system, terrestrially and via satellite. We have the ambition, uh, working with uh, uh, the new uh, cybersecurity center and network we want to create, uh, to work on the post uh, quantum encryption. We have the ambition in working with the uh, Euro HPC, I will tell you in a second what it is, so in the program for supercomputing of Europe, we have the ambition, maybe 2025, 2026, to have a generation computer with a quantum uh, uh, accelerator. So in a way, we have created not only the idea that we should advance the research, but then very quickly, that this research can be applied to very concrete projects. And probably looking at the future of quantum computing, the most important uh, promises uh, are in the area of mixing uh, today's technologies with future technologies. So under the Austrian presidency, the uh, council has agreed uh, to the uh, regulation that sets the common enterprise between us and the member states, which is called EuroHPC. The European Commission will invest immediately 500 million euros, and uh, member states will be asked to do the same. We will start immediately by uh, deploying high-performance computing in Europe at the level which is unknown today to catch up, because we have to catch up. In the future, we want that uh, this EuroHPC 
would be able also to look at quantum uh, elements in supercomputing. What will be those elements? Will be the flagship, of course, telling us what will be mature. So, in a way, we have in front of us a very solid path. That's why uh, today is a day that we can relax and celebrate, because we have a, a solid commitment from the member states to work together, because in high technology, if Europe doesn't work together, it will be nowhere. We have uh, funding from the European Commission already uh, uh, programmed for this year, next year, 150 million, which are topping up the already 500 million of euros which we spent in the last decade for quantum computing and quantum in general. We have a clear plan for the continuation. But of course now, what is the salt of uh, this meal has to come from the quantum uh, uh, community altogether. I mean, of the bureaucrats, the, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a bureaucrat, although, although I don't feel like a bureaucrat, but I am a bureaucrat. Uh, the bureaucrats cannot, cannot really uh, invent the next quantum computer. That will be you. So uh, today, really, we give you the possibility to start and to uh, the hope of all of us that this journey that starts together in Vienna will be a long one and will uh, probably will be beyond even uh, uh, our solar system. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next song is jazz, right? Jazz standard. Uh, written by Duke Ellington, and it's called Caravan. Okay, time to go into the scientific chase of uh, today's uh, subject. So the next speaker that was already uh, mentioned by Minister Fassmann in his uh, opening remarks is Professor Ante Zeilinger, uh, the president of the Austrian Academy of Science. Uh, so Professor Zeilinger, if you'd like to come on stage and take us through a scientific keynote, welcome. Welcome everybody, this is indeed a very special day. It's kick off of, uh, kick off of the uh, quantum flagship. And we, I mean many of us, have been waiting for a long time that this happens in Europe. And I'm happy it happens now. Now you see, uh, uh, our minister has mentioned my name in the talk. So I'm not Schrödinger and I'm not Schrödinger's cat, <laughs> just to make that sure. So as a title, I chose from Quant, is there also a microphone like this for me? Or do I have to stand here? Ah, thank you. I thought this way I could walk around. I chose the title from Quant, is this on? 
from quantum puzzles to the quantum uh, flagship. So you see here a telescope, a telescope which was built for communication and not for, for watching stars. And communication is one of the main topics of the uh, flagship. It's on Tenerife on the Canary Islands. Uh, next one. Uh, Bill Phillips was already quoted in the introductory uh, talk this morning. Uh, he said that quantum information processing and communication, and you should also probably, uh, processing is computation, is more fundamentally different from current technology than the digital computers from the abacus, in the sense that information is represented in a completely novel way there. The main topic, the main line of my, of my talk is the following. If you just look at the developments, uh, quantum physics began in 1900 or immediately afterwards with names like Planck and Einstein. And in the 1930s, a debate began what this really means in the conceptual sense. What does it tell us about the world? Uh, there were many people participating in that debate. Among them were Bohr and Einstein. Uh, the essential point of that debate were uh, predictions for individual quantum systems, which could not be done at that time. That's very important now. It, with individual particles, which could not be done at that time. So there were Gedanken experiments. From the 1970s on, such experiments became possible. And they were because of the invention of the laser, because of the invention of high flux reactors and other things. And uh, these experiments were at that time done just out of mere curiosity, out of mere curiosity. No application in sight. And today we have this kickoff. In the 1990s, to the surprise of everyone in the field, concepts of quantum information were invented, which were very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, far away from realization at that time, I would, I would say. They include quantum computer, quantum communication, quantum teleportation, quantum cryptography, and now I should end, add the new uh, fields like quantum sensing, quantum simulation, etc. And this finally uh, leads to ideas or even realizations of real applications. So again, this whole field started because of curiosity, or curiosity-driven research, and not, and not uh, because one wanted to build this or that or another machine. The basic, <laughs> the basic animal is the old uh, double slit interference to discuss these things. I know the. We have an audience which consists of people uh, who teach these things themselves and other people who are more uh, are technically inclined. Uh, I don't want to go into details. I don't want to explain what this is all about. Uh, the debate simply was, and still to some extent is to this day, it's the discussion between two positions. Albert Einstein said, that physics has to be say, has to be about what is, what exists, about reality. And Niels Bohr said, no, physics can only be about what can be said about the world. This sounds academic, but if you replace what can be said about the world by information, then we are at a very modern view. Quantum physics maybe is about information. I show this picture. It's the famous double slit interference with meta waves because it gives me the chance to quote our chairman of the whole enterprise here, Jürgen Mlinek, who did an experiment with the double slit with atoms uh, many years ago. Uh, my understanding, it was the first or among the very first experiments uh, done uh, 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 with atom, uh, atom interference experiments. Such experiments at that time, again, were an academic exercise, and now we talk about sensors, rotation sensors using atomic interference, and so on and so on. So all this came, came to fruit. An important point is, how big can the objects be? Because it was mentioned 
I think it was in your, in your uh, brief introduction that we talk about the very small. Is quantum physics necessarily restricted to the very small? The theory doesn't tell us anything about that. So it's one of the interesting projects to extend this to larger and larger objects, which I predict will also lead to novel applications. It's actually leading already to novel ap applications. Here's Schrodinger's cat. I had to show it <laughs> because I knew that, the, well, I guess that our minister will mention it. Uh, the question is how to talk about this situation where the cat is in a, in a superposition, as we say, between dead and alive because it is intimately connected to a radioactive atom of which we know that we can describe, describe it, that it is in a superposition of decayed and not decayed. Now, one could say that this is just an academic discussion, it doesn't lead to much, but again, this is a research program to realize these kind of things with larger and larger objects. And maybe so I've been saying for many years, someday we will see superpositions of living systems. Probably we will not live anymore at that time, unfortunately. The big question is why do we have a classical world? Why do we see objects not in superpositions? And you know, there are scores of papers about this and there are hot debates, I don't want to get into this. Uh, the, the mere point is, again, a research program to realize uh, these things for larger and larger objects. I, in my eyes, the beginning of the quantum information uh, era is this idea of Stephen Wiesner in 1970, which he was not be able to publish for a long time. He invented quantum money. He said, okay, we can, we can print uh, 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 quantum uh, bills which cannot be forged because I print the number onto the quantum bits, uh, qu quantum, quantum uh, 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 bill in quantum states. In quantum states, uh, this is a small uh, sketch here where I try to indicate different quantum states of photons and uh, this cannot be copied because the quantum systems cannot be cloned. It cannot be copied because uh, when you measure it improperly, you have in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, intrinsic randomness and you have complementarity between different observations. I don't know if we have someday uh, quantum uh, uh, bills in our pocket, but these methods are actually being used in cryptography and other systems. Here is the uh, uh, layman's introduction in what the difference is between a bit and a qubit. You know, as physicists, we say it doesn't make sense to talk about bits without physical representation. Here is a representation, a switch, which is on or off, zero or one. Uh, it is definitely one of the two. A quantum bit is in a superposition of the two. It is in some sense zero and one, actually with different weights. Uh, so I introduced to you the quantum bit in an easy way. Uh, we have randomness. Albert Einstein was, uh, had, was not happy with this randomness in quantum mechanics. And he wrote in a letter to Max Born in 1926, in any case, I'm convinced that God does not play dice with the universe. And you know the answer of Niels Bohr Stop telling the world how to run, to, stop telling the Lord how to run the universe. Now, the important point is again, this was an academic discussion, and now we build quantum ran random number generators. And we think that even that there can, can be business here in building quantum random number generators the right, the right way. The other concept, which I was already mentioned a little bit, is entanglement or in German, Verschränkung. Verschränkung, by the way, is a much better name. Entanglement is more like spaghetti. Verschränkung is like this, a very well-defined connection. This goes back to this famous paper by uh, Albert Einstein in 1935, uh, uh, where he talks about correlations between distant systems. And basically, measurement on one uh, changes the quantum state of the other one. He called this spooky action at a distance and he, in the same letter to Born, where he complained about 
randomness also complained about this kind of spooky action and he thought that must be a physics without it. That is a point where we, he probably was wrong. This kind of entanglement, and you know I'm back at fundamental considerations, can be nicely imaged by uh, considering a pair of dice. A pair of dice which always sh show the same uh, number, 6-6 six, six, or 3-3 three, three or 2-2, two, two, but each one of those is completely random. And the big question is how can it be two, two processes which are com completely random, random in a way that we believe that there is no individual cause, uh, result in the same outcome. Schrodinger said, I would not call that one, but rather the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics, that one, the one that enforces its entire departure from classical lines of thought. Here is Schrodinger's grave in Alpbach, and this is Schrodinger's equation, probably the most important, technologically the most important question ever written down by anyone. And here you see something like the development of our field, which is important to me. The citation, scientific citations of the einstein podolsky rosen paper over the years. The paper came out in 1935. It was had very few citations. Uh, well, two of these citations were by Schrödinger. One was by uh, Niels Bohr, so not bad citations. You know? <laughs> not bad citations, but very few. And then it decided, the whole field was considered to be merely phil uh, philosophical, without any, any application. Then you see in the, in the 80s it picks up. This was because John Bell discovered that Einstein's position in the, in the uh, uh, paper can be put to test. And around 2000 it really virtually exploded. Now the paper is quoted uh, uh, more than once a day. It's by far the most often quoted paper of Einstein, it is one of the foundations of our field here. It is quoted nearly every day, but I'm not sure that it's read every day. <laughs> That's a different story, maybe. So, uh, uh, now to, to entanglement, uh, 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 these experiments, I showed you the two dice which were uh, entangled uh, when we talk about photons or anything else, we have Alice and Bob, and they measure correlations between the two uh, systems which cannot be explained by either a cause propagating for from A to B or B to A, nor by intrinsic properties of the system uh, which would define the individual measurement. So this is really random. The first, exp here I wrote down some history of, of experiments. Uh, I don't want to go into detail. That was the first experiment many, many years ago. Uh, it's also historically interesting how nice this is drawn in the old days. Uh, there are still ongoing many experiments because there are discussions about loopholes and this whole thing is, is connected to the security of quantum cryptography and therefore to what we do today. Two examples, I show you this example which I discovered again uh, just a few days ago while preparing this talk. I think it's the first uh, paper which writes in the title plug and play system. Uh, it's, my, it's my feeling, it was an experiment, but so we are five ahead. Now we're talking about 2018 and we are developing plug and play systems in the present, in the present uh, 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 flagship. This was an experiment done in Geneva uh, uh, in the lake, in the, uh, under the fibers in the lake. And here's a, another picture I show an entanglement based cryptography uh, uh, encoding this Venus of Willendorf was published in PRL and to the best of our knowledge it was the first and so far only time when the picture of a person was published in the best, science, uh, best physics paper in the world. Uh, here again, these, uh, these fundamental experiments continue, continue, continue over the years and uh, like long distance tests of these things leads to leads to uh, without knowing at that time uh, very much about it lead to tests for for space experiments for doing this from satellites uh, where you all know the beautiful results which were obtained with the with the uh, Chinese satellite Mitsios in the last two years. One of the future developments is multiparticle entanglement where again uh, more and more information can be encoded by having uh, many 
systems uh, entangled with each other. This is also uh, essential in quantum computers, and so on and so on. If I mention the quantum computer, the, qu uh, the, the uh, name quantum chip is actually copyrighted. I understand Harald Weinfurter, who was the first to introduce it. Uh, it also builds on, uh, so it also builds on, on superposition, randomness, entanglement, and so on and so on. You have seen pictures uh, this morning of, of setups like the one of Freiner Platt in, in Innsbruck and others. I would like to come to a, a close slowly. As I said, the experiments are going on. Uh, we talk about worldwide efforts. This here symbolizes the collaboration of a, of a uh, what's called the big bell test. A big bell test where many groups all over the world, you see them uh, uh, pictured here, uh, it's 13 groups, this must be a lucky number, 13 groups all over the world uh, realized a uh, bell inequality test, so the test of, of, of uh, what is called local realism, and uh, with input from people, from humans. So there was a little app where people could type in what they considered to be good random numbers, and they were distributed, like if you in Innsbruck type in uh, some numbers, they could be distributed to, to China or to, to Australia or wherever, and there they, they set the parameters of the experiment. So, so this is the largest test so far of these kind of things, which was published this year. The project leader was Morgan Mitchell. And I show you this picture because I personally believe that the future of this field is worldwide collaboration. We should all collaborate, but we only can collaborate if everyone who collaborates is on the top level. Otherwise, the collaboration is not a collaboration. And in that sense, it is very important to have the quantum flagship to collaborate with other regions in the world and bring the, the field forward and forward and forward. Uh, here was a recent, a recent experiment for your entertainment. One can, be, one can in entertain crazy ideas and even realize them in experiment. Uh, the idea is that if you have entangled photons originating from here and send it to two stations, then the, the measurements you decide here, they could in principle have been influenced by something earlier. So you want to do it in a way which is absolutely independent. And the best way to do it is to go very far out to look for photons which are at the edge of the universe 8 or 12 billion years away use their random fluctuations to decide what you measure here. This was an experiment which was recently done on the Canary Islands. I understand that the quantum flagship is not yet using stars, starlight, but maybe, you never know. I heard in one of the mentions, I heard, I think it was our minister that you said, maybe it goes even beyond the Earth. <laughs> So I would like to come to an end now. I uh, took enough of your attention, which I'm very grateful. Here's a famous statement by Western Union Financial Services in 1876, who were asked to invest into the telephone, and the answer is, was the telephone has so many problems that it cannot be used for communication. That thing has no value whatsoever for us. Which is nice, one can, one can error in that direction, but on the other hand, one can never be sure whether <laughs> something works out. <laughs> and uh, I hope that many things in the, in the, flag shop, the flagship really work out. And I conclude with uh, this statement here by Werner von Siemens. I wrote it in German because that was the original. Werner von Siemens was not nobody. He created uh, one of the largest technology companies in the, in the world. And he said, the uh, uh, progress in the natural sciences always forms the safe uh, floor for technical progress. The industry of a country will never achieve an internationally leading position and stay there if the country is not at the same time at the top of the scientific prog uh, progress. To achieve this, namely to be at the top of the scientific progress, is the most important means to uh, uh, keep the industry up. 
And I would say the flagship is part of this, but it's very important to not forget that maybe the future challenges could be challenges which are based on fundamental research which has not been done yet. So this really must be part of the whole efforts. And here's a picture for the end, which I got from Charlie Bennett. As always, this is from a parking lot near Washington, D.C. And as always, our friends across the pond are ahead of us. They seem to have quantum cars. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now listen uh, to um, music, Musette Valls, right? Uh, I believe the title is Indifférence, right? It's, should I pronounce it in French? Does that work? <laughs> okay, great. Please. Thank you. Uh, I will now uh, call the last keynote speaker on stage to hear what's the, what's the point of view from the industry. And in fact, we will hear from a man that has been in um, the highest management position in a number of uh, companies in the IT and telecom sectors. Please welcome Thierry Breton. He's the CEO of ATOS, the International Information Services Company. Monsieur Breton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for this uh, fantastic journey. Thank you, Mr. Minister, also for your comments and remarks. There is something in common, Professor, it what you show us today, reminding us the history of quantum physics and the upcoming applications. What is in common? Mr. Minister, you remind us that in 1887, Erwin Schrodinger was born here in Vienna. By the way, you could have spoke also of Pauli. He was also born in 1900 in Vienna too. But what else, Professor? In all the names you presented to us in this fresque, there were all Europeans. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, quantum physics is about Europe. And what is absolutely fantastic for me, who is a scientist, I'm a CEO too, Mr. Minister, I have been also Minister of Finance. Nobody's perfect, <laughs> but not too long. What is so fantastic is that quantum physics is just the history of a small team of young, crazy physicists, most of us below 30. A little bit more than 100 years ago, 
inventing something totally unthinkable. And guess what? When I'm going to Roma, bah, they could speak about uh, Fermi. When I'm going to Bristol, they could speak about Dirac. When I'm coming to Paris, they could speak about De Bruyne. When I'm, when I'm coming, Mr. Director of the European Commission in Catane, they could speak about uh, Ettore Majorana, or in Roma, about Fermi, and so on. Of course, I don't forget Munich with Heisenberg. Yes, quantum physics is about Hurat. And guess what? More than 100 years ago, Mr. Director, they decided to meet every year at Hotel Metropole, where in Bruxelles. So it's absolutely normal that 100 years after, here you are with the European Commission to launch this fantastic initiative, which is 100 years after, yes, it works, and we can now foresee the progress that we can expect. Of course, you mentioned most of them, a lot of them. And I will focus myself only on what we are work working on in Atos, which is obviously quantum computer. Atos, of course, uh, Atos Bull is the only, we are 120,000 uh, engineers in the world, but mostly in Europe, and we are the only European manufacturer of supercomputer, so-called uh, HPC, alongside with uh, uh, American, Chinese, and of course Japanese. Not too many on the planet, four or five able to build exascale computer, which is what we are doing to, to do now. Our customers, of course, are R&D centers, the academic world, weather forecast, defense, of course, industry, universities, R&D. And uh, obviously, I should tell you that um, quantum information truly represents today for us both a fantastic opportunity, a challenge, but also a major disruption in uh, this uh, domain. Perhaps most important, or even more important, than uh, the one we knew, especially in my industry, with uh, uh, the transistors. We owe it to, current, to our current customers to be the first commercial company in Europe in a position to offer them, as soon as possible, new applications. As I said, of course, we're working on um, delivering exascale, and I know this is very important for the European Commission, and the European Commission is absolutely right to push us here. It is also a matter of sovereignty, I should say so, uh, which is, again, computer being able to um, compute one billion of billion of operations per second, and we will achieve this by 2020 as, uh, as planned. But we know also that uh, the uh, Moore's law is maybe, probably, coming to an end. At least we are working now at 11, 9, maybe 7 nanometers. And here, of course, when we are working at this scale, we start to feel the quantum effects. And this is where we reach now the quantum physics. And this is why um, to meet the post-exascale supercomputer, which is our next, our next target, 2024, we need to think differently. We need to add what Richard Feynman was the first to imagine, the first application of quantum physics for quantum computing. And uh, in this uh, post-exascale concept, it is absolutely mandatory to, um, to start to think how we will be able to use both what we delivered in traditional computing and also the benefit of quantum physics to accelerate on our HPC uh, the capacity that uh, we need and maybe to reach 
before to see a pure quantum computer. I really don't know when we will see it. You mentioned nephew, Mr. Viola, maybe son, grandson, I don't know. But yes, accelerators on HPC. This is where we are working and we are committed to do this and we'll say a few words on it within the next five years. Will we be able to call the so-called quantum supremacy? I don't know yet, but we will need to develop in parallel specific algorithms to be able to take benefit of this acceleration and this is what we are doing now. So you see, to reach this momentum, we have invested both in relations for the qubit, and I will speak of, two, of course of uh, our cooperation with Professor Rainer Blatt, uh, with a trapped iron, fantastic. What he's doing in Innsbruck is just amazing. We have a good strong cooperation now. But also we have to develop the languages, the algorithms, and for me, to train the new generation starting to work already on these new machines, inventing new language, inventing new algorithms. So this is the two pillars where we're investing and where we are working for. So the first direction aims at developing, again, quantum computers based on qubits and, of course, quantum gates. With respect of famous um, David Senso five criteria, by the way, uh, David David Senso is a member of our scientific uh, community at Atos. And to do so, again, as I mentioned, we have chosen an industrial strategy in two steps. The first step is done, practically. We have developed and commercial today a powerful programming platform to learn, program, optimize, and test by emulation up to 41 qubits machine to develop quantum algorithms. And this is the Atos, we call it the Atos QLM, quantum learning machine, that we sell uh, all over the world, in US, uh, uh, in Austria, of course, here, in Germany, in France, Netherlands, and, and, and many other countries. Still, I should say, uh, uh, unrivaled on the market. And again, my goal here, our goal, is to train the new generation of physicists and also um, uh, um, um, developers. I say physicists because, of course, you need also this machine to calibrate, to calibrate your experiments. Professor Reinerblatt, you know that. Uh, uh, and that's, that's very uh, important. By the way, our new version of uh, QLM can simulate not only logical qubits, but also physical qubits by considering the noise models so that developers can predict with QLM the true performance of their algorithm depending on hardware they are targeting. And we hope, Mr. Viola, that uh, these uh, unique capabilities will help the Quantum Flagship Consortium uh, to reach their objective. We have engaged a second step for quantum computing, as I said, in July this year, and we are committed to develop and sell a true quantum accelerator. My goal is within the next five years that we will embed on top of HPCs, gathering between 50 to 100 physical qubits with a global entanglement, but uh, without error correction which is very important. We know already uh, algorithm applications running on such accelerators and that cannot run on traditional IT for quantum chemistry, for example, uh, electronic orbital simulation, nuclear physics, many body problem, material science, and even machine learning, thanks to uh, the recent hybrid quantum algorithm like QAOA. And some of our QLM customers and prospects are perfectly clear with us. They are waiting for such an acceleration platform. They want it really. They have no choice. We will deliver it. And I hope that Europe will be the first one to do this. So I'm very happy in this uh, sense uh, that uh, our quantum flagship project action was awarded by the Commission, again together with Professor Rainer Blatt uh, and, um, and with the support of uh, of, uh, of this, uh, this will be extremely important 
uh, in the development of our quantum accelerator that we are committed to deliver. In, this, in that very complex environment, of course, we cannot be alone. And that's why uh, one of the other fantastic outcomes with this flagship is that we will have around us a total ecosystem of partners we'll be able to work with, which is exactly what we need as industrialists. The second direction that Atos is exploring, is exploring is, as I mentioned, quantum simulation, but I need to say one word on it. Of course, it has been suggested by uh, Richard Feynman, as I mentioned, in the uh, uh, early 80s, which differs from quantum computing by the fact that the atoms or ions in the quantum cluster cannot be addressed individually. This is not, uh, again, general purpose computers with consequently less problems that can be solved, but it permits exponential acceleration, which is absolutely uh, mandatory at large scale, up to 500 atoms or ions, with promising application again in material science, quantum chemistry, high energy physics, optimization problems for industry, and you mentioned it, of course, security. So I am again here very proud to have uh, our quantum flagship project PASCONS awarded by the Commission with Max Planck Institute and French Institute of Optics, here again, a European uh, uh, cooperation. Focusing on quantum simulation up to 500 atoms. But again, we are industrialists. And the beauty is that we have already strong demands for a lot of potential customers in this uh, application. And I would like to mention some because we have a, a discussion with uh, Total, for example, Bosch, Airbus, French EDF, Siemens that you mentioned, uh, uh, which are of course key European industry and with whom we are working to help them to use these new tools for their own development. It is clear to me that Europe will progress in quantum business only if considered as a whole, hardware, software, algorithm, and applications. Remember in 1994, when Peter Shaw had shown the way of quantum acceleration with his famous algorithm. This has been the very beginning of quantum computing, quantum computing race, for everybody, researchers, VC, states, and this was only an algorithm disruption, not a hardware one. Of course, we are using it now, and we'll accelerate it. We could speak also of the Grove and, and, and everyone. In this respect, we consider that quantum supremacy will be more easily met if the hardware component, qubit circuit and simulation clusters, is treated simultaneously and in synergy with the software component. And of course, while optim optimizing quantum programs. And also with the use case that will be computed, factorization, optimization, simulation, machine learning, and so on. So we as industrialists defend this almost vertical approach to quantum information processing the same phenomenon on verticalization is also observed in artificial intelligence, which is another prior European priority, where the computational architectures and the machine learning algorithm are very dependent of the nature of the problem to be learned and solved. We have in Europe top researchers, we just mentioned it, but we still have fantastic universities. I could tell you a fantastic appetite with our new scientists, the new generation. When I speak of this universe, quantum opportunities, they are thrilled. It's fantastic to see their eyes. Of course, we need to keep them in Europe because we have everything. And I would like again thank you, the European Commission, to have taken, it is very courageous. I mean, in a very complex environment like Europe, with European politicians, Mr. Minister, to drive them under a very sophisticated scientific program. 
It is not easy. Congratulations. Thank you for Commissioner Gabriel. Thank you for Vice President Sip. I mean, they did a fantastic job. And believe me, it helps me. When I'm running around on the world, I could say, not only reminding the history of quantum physics, but think this is what we are doing on our continent. We are in the race. Of course, we see what happened in China. Of course, we see what happened with Google, by the way, the head of Google Labs uh, was trained in uh, French CEA. Huh? This is what he got his PhD or postdoc. So uh, we know all this team. How many people are we talking about in quantum physics? 3,000, 4,000 over the planet? My team, which is much more competent than me, know most of them. It's a small family. We need to keep our young talents in Europe. And this is why, again, we were waiting for this flagship not only for the money, of course, but for the tool to federate around what will be, I believe, the most important, important step forward in science in the 21st century and allowing us, allowing Europe to be in the race. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Breton. So we have uh, plenty of food for thought and plenty to discuss uh, in the next session. But before uh, I invite uh, the next group of speakers that I will introduce in a minute, it's a good time maybe to introduce the musicians. So Dick Berger at the guitar, please, round of applause. <laughs> also at the guitar, Gillian, Gillian Wolmuth. <laughs> and at the bass, the father of Dick New, Joshi Sneberger. <laughs> so we'll go for uh, another small, short music break. Uh, that is uh, a piece of music written by Marc Antoine Charpentier. And uh, that's the prelude of his Te Deum in. D major, which is since 1954 uh, a popular song because it became the Eurovision trailer. So, gentlemen. <laughs> All right, so we're now kicking off the second part of this afternoon. Uh, we'll have, it is, uh, I suspect the organizers did that on purpose because the next session is gonna be a bit of Eurovision, quantum Eurovision contest with 11 countries represented on stage plus the European Commission. Oh, now, it, I don't know what that's going to be. Um, it's, it's unusual to have so many speakers and to have so many countries represented. So that promises a very interesting debate. So what I'll do is that I'll call you all up on stage, introducing you, and then we will kick off. So starting on the right, Minister Fassman, this is your seat. Again, Federal Minister of Science, Education and Research for Austria. Next to you, you have Roberto Viola, Director General at DigiConnect European Commission. We will leave this seat empty for a little while until uh, State Secretary uh, Preda 
arrived to Romania. Then Jarna Istromayer, State Secretary uh, from Slovenia. Continuing, Ambassador Bruno Moore. You are a um, delegate for international research organizations uh, at the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs, Education and Research, states, uh, at the State Secretariat for Education, Research and Innovation. That was long. Switzerland. <laughs> then from the Netherlands, uh, Freke Eyman Tepaske. You have a double hat today, actually. Come on stage. Uh, you are uh, an advisor, uh, well, a director for quantum technologies at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy. You're also with QTech Center, which matters, so we'll come back to that. Uh, Director General Lucas, please come on stage from Germany. So Director General for Research for Digitalization and Innovation at the Federal Ministry for Education and Research Ministry, as I said. For Spain, Teresa Riesgo, uh, Director General for Research, Development and Innovation at the Ministry of Science, Innovation and Universities. Then we'll move to Italy <laughs> with uh, Giuseppe Valditara, Head of Department for Higher Education and Research at the Ministry of Education, Universities and Research. Staying in the Mediterranean area, we have a Portuguese speaker. Luis Soares Barbosa, you are uh, the deputy head of the United Nations University and also associated professor at University Dominio. Welcome. For France, Monsieur Bourgoin, uh, your research senior advisor uh, for the, the French Ministry uh, of Higher Education, Research and Innovation. Welcome, and finally, a Finnish representative, Annele Latinen, uh, you're a senior advisor and you're with the Academy of Finland. Welcome to all of you. There is not enough space, I'll go down. You won't see me, but you don't really need to see me anyway. There is enough people on stage. So, why don't we start by a round of applause for all these people who travel all the way. So, this is a European setting, but I think what we want to hear um, now in this session, we want to take a bit of altitude and understand what is at stake in your countries and to see how do your national plans fit with the European ambitions that we heard about. So, maybe can I start with you, uh, State Secretary uh, Stromayer? Um, how does Slovenia think of quantum technologies? Do you have any plan in place or are you, do you have any specific objectives in the coming years? Well, uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here at the Hofburg. Uh, well, we're, we're here so you can see that you're very devoted to this flagship project and this whole funding idea of quantum physics is a really big potential for Europe and for our research and development sphere. So Slovenia, as you probably, most of you, some of you know, uh, most of our research funding is bottom-up. So we already have a lot of projects working on the field of uh, quantum physics and we're really happy about it. And our experts in this area have already formed an informal network. So they're really trying to be as progressive in this area as possible and our ministry, of course, will try to support them all the way through. So today's event is really probably a beginning of a wonderful journey for all of us and we hope it will be as fruitful as possible. Do you want to tell us a little bit more? Do you have, um, and what's the, what's the budget? What's the annual budget uh, allocated to quantum technologies, for instance, in Slovenia? Well, you now you got me started with numbers. It will probably be not enough. That would be probably the politician's answer for this kind of questions. Uh, it depends. It's a couple of hundred thousand euros, I think, out of my head. Okay, but that's interesting to see because we'd come to that in, uh, in a little while, but we need to understand how uh, national initiatives uh, complement uh, European initiatives. So numbers may not really matter, but still it's, uh, it's a matter of complementarity between the different levels. 
Um, should I move to Germany next? Director General Lucas, do you want to give us uh, an overview of uh, how, uh, what, the, what the plans are for quantum technologies in Germany? Yeah, first of all, I think we should say here in this room, I think that uh, the idea of a quantum uh, fl uh, technology flagship was a great idea. Why? Because I think we t took action afterwards, after this idea was in Europe. So I think this is typical for Europe. We all think what are the other member states in the commission are planning. And if we see that one of the member states has a good idea, or the commission, then we think, great, let's follow them. So thank you for the initiative, because I normally one te uh, is telling the story, I think one has invented, you know, if you go to Russia, everybody was invented in Russia. If you go to the United States, everything was in, uh, invented in the United States. If you come to Europe, of course, everything was invented here. And the last sentence is true. Um, so I think then we took action and we said, when there is a flagship, we want to prepare it because we want to spend money in a flagship. We want to have our own research. We want to strengthen, uh, strengthen our research uh, institutes. And so we have, uh, I think we had a program, we now we have a program. It's not a program of the research ministry, it's a, a program of the whole government. Uh, so I think the Ministry for Economy is, is, is supporting us uh, and also the Ministry for Interior and the Ministry, I think, for Defense. So I think this is a great thing, first of all. Second good story is we got support from Parliament. I hope we will get support from Parliament because our budget is not decided. But I think in the draft, I think there is money available for quantum technology. And I will not, uh, I come to the figures. But just a second, but one has to say what is behind. And let me say one thing here. I would say we should not only focus on what the Commission's plan is and is. I think first we all have to uh, t take our duty and all member states to be prepared. I think Europe is strong not when one country is strong. Europe is strong when all countries are strong and we are go together. So if I take now tell you the figure what we are planning, then this is for Europe, it's not only for our research, because it's also not for Europe. We want to get the best talents to Germany, or to Europe, or <laughs> to the Netherlands, <laughs> uh, to my colleagues. So we have planned to spend uh, 60, um, six, 650 million euro for five years in, in, in both basic research and applied research, and we want also focus on, I think we want to also to get the low-hanging fruits and can I have a, another word? Sure. Yeah? I think we talked, uh, I think Minister Fa uh, uh, Fassmann was, I think, saying sometimes, I think we should explain it to the people, to, uh, we, uh, to our people, why we are spending the money. Let me make a first comment. First of all, all the people are also interested in curiosity. It's not only the scientists. When we uh, now see pictures from the Mars, I think the people are really interested in, if you see the downloads. So we should talk about the application. We should talk about how is this is good for our society. But we should also talk about the spooky things, the curiosity. The people are not, as I say, not that stupid. I think they're also interested in this. So, and we should say, we don't know when a quantum computer will come. Industry was saying the same. But we should say that if they come, forget about the digital computers or better, Take the digital computers for calculating and the other for searching uh, for new results. So I would say si 65 and what we want to spend this in a quantum flagship, we want to spend this also for uh, a mission of whatever, quantum, compu uh, quantum computers, quantum communication, so we are ready, but we are asking also for the support and of course for new ideas from other member states and the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Should we move to Spain and Portugal. The reason why I think there should also uh, this, <laughs> we can start with Director General Riesgo, but uh, Thank you. <laughs> I'm interested in a specific project, but then you need to take me uh, to the next level. And there is a project called Quanta Lab, right? That is an Iberian uh, initiative, uh, both uh, taken uh, from uh, Spain and Portugal. So that's 
how should we understand it? Is it something that came from the initiative of the scientific community, or is there some specific plans between the two countries uh, to carry on uh, a plan around quantum, comput quantum computing and quantum technology? Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, actually, Quanta Lab is one of the projects in which Portugal is um, is part of. So this is a, 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 a partnership between a Portuguese university, Univers University of Minho, and INL, the Nanotechnologies Iberian Institute, wh where, where Spain is um, a very active partner. And Quanta Lab actually um, uh, was born in a bottom up bottom up way. Uh, fostering synergies between different groups, different institutions, and also the, the private sector. Uh, and we are, I would say, part of this uh, um, huge bottom-up approach that Portugal is going on with several other groups and labs along the country in, 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 the, in this sector. I, I, before you ask me about numbers, I, that I no, don't no, know. No, 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 but don't. I, hey, I'm <laughs> I not I, obsessed I, with numbers. Can, I'm not going to I, ask all of you about numbers. Sure. <laughs> what, what I would like to stress is that, uh, independent of the, the absolute numbers, the derivative of the investment in, in uh, science and technology in this multilateral approach, not only quantum, but also um, HPC, GRID, and, all the, and the exploring the interconnection between them uh, is, um, is really very positive in, in Porto Nadal. At the government level between Portugal and Spain, is there any p any joint initiative? Um, yes, th there are. Um, I, I, I can't speak about what we're doing in Quantalab, and there are several uh, projects in, uh, in in the borders uh, of, of Portugal and Spain, promoting uh, not only research but something which is very um, fundamental for the success of this program, which is training. We actually need to train young scientists, young engineers in this area, and that's something we are starting to do. Very good. Director General Riesco, would like to, to add anything and any specific initiative in Spain? Yes, in, um, I say it's, it's true that the, the cooperation now, in particularly in, in between Spain and Portugal in scientific issues, is very, very important. In HPC, for example, in supercomputing, is also as I start in a, a good initiative on that. Okay, in, um, um, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting us and congratulations for this uh, very successful uh, uh, flagship that I think it will be uh, extremely relevant for the, for the future of Europe, as everybody has said here, so uh, I don't want to add anything else on that. I, I would like to also to, to say that uh, in Spain we are very much in line and we have... Uh, I say a strong commitment on this on this flagship, yeah, and and we want to 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 say that um, we have uh, I say most of the initiatives in Spain have started bottom up, that uh, this is uh, very much as 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 they should start as we think we should start in in the scientific arena. I mean, uh, of the very uh, excellent research groups going to uh, con competitive calls and and having I say all the all these. Uh, um, money from them. Um, um, I don't know what, in which uh, year, but th there has been also uh, a very uh, interesting uh, partnership in Spain that was uh, funded by the by the government, uh, related with um, 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 11, 11 groups, as I think, from different institutions working together in uh, quantum photonics, and. Um, this is this was funded under uh, something that was called Consolider that existed in the in the past in Spain, but there exist also um, um, bottom-up initiatives that are starting now that are very interesting. For example, uh, in the in the research council, the Spanish research council, the CSIC, which is uh, one of the largest in uh, in Europe, actually, um, they have started uh, an initiative that is. Um, um, internal to the to the council, but uh, multi um, um, with, I say having different addressing different aspects of quantum computing, and this is something that is also uh, I think it will be very promising because uh, the council is I say is represented here by one of his vice presidents and uh, and is extremely active both in basic research but also in transfer and this will help a lot in the development. 
but also, I mean, there are even regional activities. In Madrid, there's, uh, there's um, um, a network that is called Quite Mad, that is also, uh, as a uh, assistant, also the, the actors in the, in the field. So um, I would like to stress that our commitment is very strong. And uh, I, we fully agree with another thing that we have, it, it has been heard today, that is uh, the importance of communicating this to, to society. I don't know if this is uh, uh, um, correct, I say, done in, in a very good way, but we need to do it for everybody is uh, very happy to pay taxes, to uh, commit to this uh, type of uh, uh, um, activities. Oh yeah, it's difficult that people are, are having, okay. But they will be happy if, uh, if they, we say, okay, this is part of your future, I say, and you will be secured and everything. So uh, I think it is, uh, this is our first uh, statement, but uh, we are very much on, online with that. Yeah. Very Thank good, you. and point taken on the need to, to communicate to the, to the citizens. So we can come back to that. Should we move to Italy? Uh, so Mr. Valtitara, you're, um, well, how is it going in Italy? What, what, are, the, what are the plans? Well, uh, I collect uh, some reflections and uh, I would like uh, to read uh, uh, my short speech, uh, if it's possible. Um, first of all, uh, good afternoon, authorities, and you all, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, guten Tag, Behörden, und guten Tag, Ihren allen Damen und Herren. It is an honor uh, and privilege for Italy to attend uh, the kickoff meeting of the Quantum Technology Flagship. It is important to be here today after the continued great effort that all of us put into this initiative. We may say that this adventure started with a study of uh, black body radiation, which marked the beginning of uh, quantum physics. This cultural revolution in physics occurred at the beginning of uh, 1900. The, revolution, uh, the revolutionary ideas of Planck, Einstein, Bohr, Fermi and many others uh, already had a huge impact uh, on the world. Our society would not exist without quantum devices such as transistor or laser. Now, our growing ability to harness the full advantages uh, of quantum effects uh, in artificial systems and materials is paving the way for a second quantum revolution. Italian scientists have been among the protagonists of both quantum revolutions. Recognizing the opportunity of the European flagship, the Italian Minister for Education, University and Research gave Italian National Research Council mandate to coordinate the national effort to offer Italian researchers the best opportunities of participation to the flagship and is working on the full definition of an Italian roadmap. Italy has always been actively supporting quantum technologies before the flagship ministry and the Italian National Research Council cooperated with agencies from 26 uh, European Union member states to launch a competitive call, Quantera. Out of 26 uh, financed projects, 16 involve Italian partners, with an investment in Italy around 3 million euros. Various Italian agencies under the coordination of Italian National Research Council will also join the second Quantera call that will be launched in November. We are here to take part to the launch of the quantum flagship ramp up phase for the period 2018-2021. Uh, Among the 19 selected projects distributed over the four flagship application pillars, and the fundamental quantum science cornerstone, Italy has 13 research group wi groups with Italian National Research Council coordinating one of the pillar initiatives in quantum simulation. CNR, Consiglio Nazionale di Ricerca, is also directly involved in the governance of the quantum flagship, directly coordinating the efforts on training and education of the flagship. The involvement of the new generation is indeed mandatory if you want uh, to successfully sail this flagship. Since these revolutionary ideas should be spread 
within our society if we want to have a new generation of people capable to benefit from this opportunity. On November the 1st, 2018, the first Italian national PhD program on quantum technologies will, be, uh, will open joining the universities of Naples Federico II in cooperation with the University of Camerino and the Consiglio Nazionale delle Ricerche. In the next years, uh, CNR is going to propose co-funded effort to offer to over 18 Italian universities PhD research grants for international students working in Italy. The European Union flagship program should also be considered an opportunity to change the perception that sometimes industrial entities have about research system and that research system likewise has about industrial entities. We as Europeans aim to be competitive towards countries such as USA and China who are already taking strong action to make the most out of this field. The involvement of high-level industries is fundamental and it is already happening in USA. Many high-tech industries in the European Union should also benefit from this opportunity. A competitive European Union needs co cohesion, synergy and trust among industrial, academic and research institutes and this program can actually foster it. The Italian Ministry for Education and University and Research has a full plan to support the efforts of national community participating to the flagship. Our actions will include support to high education program for interdisciplinary and intersectoral doctoral studies in quantum technologies, alignment of the national competitive calls for fundamental and applied research reserving a quota to quantum technologies, co-financing and promotion jointly with other ministries and or with Italian regions to facilitate common investment with private companies, spin-offs and startups active in quantum technology, so as to foster transformation of skills and outcomes deriving from research activities into product prototypes, patents and technologies called solutions. We are also working on providing Italy with quantum infrastructures. One of the key Italian uh, initiatives in quantum technologies is indeed the joint effort of Italian Meteorological Institute and CNR to create a quantum communication backbone running parallel to the time frequency distribution link that connects key research institutes and strategic infrastructure in Italy. This initiative is one part of the larger European effort to create a whole network of quantum communication channels covering entire Europe and connecting to islands as well. As a fitting example of, the, of this international collaboration, INRIM and the CNR, together with the Austrian Academy of Science and the University of Malta, are working under NATO auspices to create the first submarine quantum link. In conclusion, I wish to thank the organizers for taking us to this incredibly important event that will play a, a powerful role within the European research community. Italy strongly supports the continued sailing of the quantum flagship with a structure, content and implementation that have been already set up and fully shares the dream of creating a new quantum ecosystem of computers, simulators, sensors, and secure communications. We look forward to a large and inclusive involvement of member states also in the operating phase of the quantum flagship initiative within the Horizon European program, and we are already to support are ready to support it by liaising with the Commission and all relevant stakeholders. We should never forget that new scientific ideas are the basis of all technological developments. As you all know, uh, you all know science was born in Europe. In 1700, uh, thanks to the scientific progress, Europe was already the undisputed protagonist of industrial revolution. Quantum physics was also born in Europe and after one century is now likely to boost another industrial revolution. 
We must be part of this crucial change. We must promote and lead this industrial revolution. We must win this worldwide competition. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So, please, do, do you want to take a minute? You don't have, or you go straight? Very good. So, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Cyprian Ioan Freda, your State Secretary, uh, and from Romania. Yes. Please, come on, on stage. And look, you have a seat okay. right here. I should say, Secretary of State from the Ministry of Research and Innovation, Romania. I'll give you a minute, okay? Just catch your breath. It doesn't matter. You know we have 11 countries here on stage, so, <laughs> so why don't we go to Switzerland, actually, just for uh, a few minutes before we go back to Romania. How is it going? What's, what's in the works? and what are your objectives with, with Switzerland? Thanks a lot, dear Minister. First, one, first of all, I would like to thank Austria for having organized this very important kickoff conference. Thank you very much for your hospitality. Being asked to talk about uh, plans in my country, in Switzerland, please let me first say to whose plans my attempt of a short answer refers. I will talk about the research plans not the government's plans in first line, but the researcher plans. Because the Swiss research system works bottom up. There is no such thing as an official QT research strategy implemented by the Swiss government. To get an impression on how future plans could look like, it is instructive to have a short look back. It was in 2005 when some researchers got funding from the ETH Zurich Innovation Initiative for a proposal called QSIT, at that time being the acronym for Quantum Systems for Information Technology. Obviously, the idea behind the proposal and its implementation was not that bad, because in 2008, QSIT was broadened to a so-called ETH Poly project labeled Quantum Science and Technology. QSIT then was comprising already 14 ETH research groups and some external ones. Since 2011, QCIT is funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation under the scheme National Center of Competence in Research. This funding scheme is directed at advanced researchers who intend to jointly pursue long-term strategy in research. As of now, QCIT is a well-connected uh, and professionally managed community of more than 30 research group leaders. Some of them are with us today. Distributed all over major Swiss universities that are engaged in excellent quantum research. And it might not be too surprising that most Swiss participants in the successful proposal of the first call of the quantum technology flagship belong to the QCIT family. QSIT started early and had time to develop ideas, grow a knowledge base, and attract the pool of excellent researchers. This impressive development has been driven by the researchers' curiosity, we heard a lot of curiosity already, driven by the curiosity to explore the weird but fascinating world of quantum physics and their efforts to technology apply their discoveries. These researchers had to convince hierarchies and different boards and bodies that quantum science is not only a fascinating playground for excellent fundamental research, but also worth to be explored in a joint effort and to be funded on an appropriate scale to lay the ground for long-term technological and societal impact. QCIT is an example of how institution boards funding organization and government have accompanied the quantum science community in their curiosity-driven way over various skies from a university research group to big science community building. This success would not have been possible without QCIT participating in the evolution of European 
an international quantum research community, which was embedded in joint European efforts coordinated by the European Commission. And I do say that as a non-member of UA. Kicking off the QT flagship is a big sign that curiosity-driven research can create ideas that reach really big developments. Remember that the QT flagship has been set up in response to the needs formulated by a broad bottom-up movement of the European uh, quantum research community. We cannot enforce such developments by imposing top-down strategies, but we can, and I'm even inclined to say we are obliged to, give them the space and support to grow. Back to the question about the plan, the Swiss government and the Swiss research funders are determined to pursue giving excellent people and excellent ideas the freedom and the appropriate boundary conditions for development in a bottom-up setting of national research and education policy. The development of QCIT from modest beginnings to a sustainable national network of excellent research groups that are more than well connected with the European and international research community is an example that bottom-up really works if you care for an appropriate and sustainable environment. So I wish the project on behalf of Switzerland furthermore full success. Thanks. Thank you. So let's move to you, uh, State Secretary Preda. Uh, it would be very nice of you just to give us a quick overview of what Romania has in the works uh, in terms of quantum technologies. Okay, I just wanted to see if it's on, <laughs> so it's on. First of all, I want to I wanna apologize for the delay. I think it's the second time being in Austria having a delay, so by mathematical induction, I think I'll always be in delay. But uh, I, I strongly, I'm, I'm going to fight about, uh, about this habit of being in delay. It was a huge traffic jam around Budapest, so I had to drive from, from my home city, uh, Timisoara. Oh, you, you drove from Romania? Yes, yes. Okay, so, uh, Thank you Driving and, and talking, it's, I think, a very good complex combination. Uh, first of all, uh, before to talk as a state secretary, I want to I wanna say something as a mathematician. So for me, uh, I mean, uh, probably you know already, by 2011, uh, we have a new theory which, and there is a book actually about that, which says the end of time, the end of, uh, of the notion of time. Uh, there is a professor in Oxford, Julian Barbour, if I remember correctly, uh, who tries to unify quantum theory with, uh, with relativity theory and uh, try to deny the existence of time. Actually, in the, in the uh, Wheeler-DeWitt equation that we have in mathematics, we already do not take derivative of the time. So for us already, we passed this concept. And uh, as you can see, being in late, I already passed the, 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 <laughs> the, the notion of time. Um, and now uh, I want to make a statement uh, as a state secretary, a statement from my government. The Romanian Ministry of Research and Innovation is partner in the development and implementing of the project Quantera, Quantera, actually. The project wants to stimulate and enhance research and quantum technologies at European level by creating a framework for funding transnational collaboration projects and more generally coordinating national and regional research programs in this field and supporting additional measures on the way to unlocking the widely recognized industrial potential of QT, responding to the needs of today's society and benefiting the general public. Romania manifests an increasing interest in approaching quantum technology in everyday life. From computers to GPS, there is an undeniable advantage of QT in speeding up the search algorithm of any data. I'm still looking to find a simple uh, quantum mechanical system, two-state quantum mechanical system, so I think the qubit is the, the most approachable example. So once again, we are, we are in uh, with respect to quantum technologies. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, in the other, Frecke, can I come to you? Uh, the QTech that you're part of as well was launched already 
in 2013, right? So uh, already five years ago. Mm -hmm. So where is it now? And what was the vision at the time? And what's how does the government support the initiative? Yeah, so our national strategy actually began in 2013. Uh, uh, the national strategy has three layers. So, uh, uh, and the layers were built successively in time as well. So we started off with QTEC in Delft, uh, uh, the foundation of an institute focused on uh, quantum computing devices and a quantum internet. And it really had the mission to move from science to engineering, so technology development. And now, uh, well, it's actually really successful. It has grown to 250 people already. So uh, 250 engineers and scientists working there. And uh, we have another center of excellence uh, that was started a few years later, that was, is QSoft in Amsterdam, and that is focusing on software and algorithms. And just this year, there was a third center of excellence in uh, Eindhoven started on uh, quantum materials and devices. So that is what we call the, yeah, the foundational layer. And on top of that, we have a layer of uh, overarching programs and consortia. For instance, the Quantum Internet uh, Alliance program, together with a lot of European partners that was started today with the flagship, so that is fantastic. And also in this layer, we try to make the, the uh, platforms, the quantum platforms we build, available to the community. So uh, a few weeks ago, we launched uh, Quantum Inspire, and that's the first European quantum computer uh, accessible through the cloud. And at this point, it's uh, a simulator, so it runs on a supercomputer, but uh, we are now uh, attaching our uh, hardware platforms to it. And that, uh, well, that brings me to the final layer of our national program, and uh, we are really building it now, starting it now, uh, and that is focusing on the ecosystem and on commercialization, because, well, we heard today it's, it's not about research only, it's about creating European jobs and industry, and uh, so uh, we are uh, driving startups to grow from uh, the research institute, but also attracting uh, foreign investments and, and, and uh, uh, economic activity uh, to Delft and to the Netherlands. So probably you all know that Microsoft is uh, starting a lab uh, in Delft. So they uh, open a new lab where approximately 50 people will uh, work on the Delft campus, and that also shows uh, the recognition of the, the excellent science that's taking place in Europe. So uh, they come to Europe to because uh, the excellent science is here. And uh, well, we want to operate in a broad ecosystem. So uh, we have a few startups and also Blue Force, uh, the, the cryostats company, uh, announced to open a, a facility in Delft. So we're really working on that and investing in uh, the infrastructure that are needed there. So, and the flagship of is of course of utmost importance for, yeah, everything to uh, grow into. Very good, thank you. Can we move to uh, Monsieur Bourguin uh, and the case of France? Monsieur, well, President Macron has been very vocal about his ambitions in terms of disruptive innovation and uh, especially in the field of the new technologies uh, such as artificial intelligence and others. So what about quantum? What are the plans? There is an existing plan already, right? Well, it's, it's right that innovation and digital innovation, artificial intelligence as well are uh, really key within the uh, announcement and politics that President Macron is, is running. And of course, there, there is a relationship between artificial intelligence and quantum computing, uh, or will be. Uh, and this is, uh, this is something which I would put under uh, an umbrella, which is very simple. Uh, at present, there is a dominant role of information and communication technologies in, in our daily life. And in those technologies, usually uh, when we really look at things, we have to say that Europe is very much depending from uh, other areas of the world. 
And so uh, if I really come back to uh, quantum technology, but this would be, uh, um, this would be um, true for uh, many other technologies, um, it's really at the European level that uh, we can face with this kind of dependence. And, and France's, uh, France considered that it's absolutely mandatory for Europe uh, to lead the next technological disruption. And of course, quantum technologies are among those disruption. And that's the reason, uh, well, there is hope there because uh, quite clearly the potential is, is there, undoubtedly. Uh, we've, well, we know that in, the, in this room. And um, the flagship is an appropriate answer. So we fully support the flagship um, um, in, in France. And I would like also to commend there the, um, the European Commission for the initiative, as well as the scientific community, because it's a long journey. Um, the, the start was about almost 20 years ago. And patiently, the, the scientific community, together with the Commission, has been building uh, what we see today um, as a flagship. Now, uh, more specifically, uh, in terms of Quantum, uh, quantum science and technology, it's a long tradition in France with uh, famous names. We heard some uh, in, the, in the talks uh, we, we uh, listened to before. And um, the connection between science and technology has always been a reality uh, with respect to, uh, to uh, uh, quantum uh, in France. So um, in terms of what we are doing now in terms of national strategy, um, the uh, uh, a few numbers. Um, it's about. It's a community of about sef 700 uh, researchers, about 500 uh, postdocs and, and a PhD, 1,000 publications per year. Um, the major um, public players are involved: CNRS, CEA, and INRIA as RPOs. Uh, major universities like uh, PSL, uh, Paris Sciences Lettres, Sorbonne University, Université Paris Saclay, and Université Grenoble Alpes as well. Um, more than 50 uh, industry companies. We heard uh, Thierry Breton from Atos, but I could quote it's also Thales. And I know uh, Thierry de Buchert is in the audience. And the overall spending is of the order of uh, over 120 million uh, euro a year for uh, the spending of the public players. We are uh, presently strengthening the strategy. Um, and um, among the, the things that uh, we are working on, the first thing I would like to, to mention is the, uh, the, uh, the fact that we um, increased the budget uh, by 50% at, uh, at our national research agency to really nurture the, uh, the basic research uh, project. But at the same time, we've also strengthened the, uh, the international cooperation, of course in Europe, first of all, and, and foremost but as well as with uh, other players which are important and Professor Zeilinger showed that it, quantum issues are really uh, worldwide um, uh, issues. And uh, I would like to quote here Australia uh, as well as Japan as, as uh, partners with which uh, we also work. And to, to finish with uh, the strengthening we are working on, I'd like to stress that um, we are launch launching an effort to, to close the gap, the, the gap or the loop between high performance computing and uh, quantum technologies, as well as artificial intelligence. And overall, we think we will be able to consolidate the national strategy in the next few months. Uh, also, um, implementing um, a part related to training in that strategy, which is something which is really very, very important for the future. Very good, thank you. So let's finish the tour with Finland, with Ms. Latinen. Do you want to take us through uh, the plans in Finland, please? Thank you. Finland is happy to be with this great uh, flagship. Congratulations for starting it. Um, in Finland, we have not uh, um, had the thematic programs, but the success of the um, researchers now to get into the flagship lies behind the long uh, uh, tradition of funding of bottom-up research. Um, Academy of Finland is, is under Minister of Education and Culture with a budget annual budget of 450 million um, annually. And we fund all the researchers through um, mostly bottom-up uh, instruments. 
Then we have a couple of um, thematic programs and uh, funding for um, uh, environments like infrastructures. Um, so um, the funding is highly competed and the best uh, um, scientists get the funding. And uh, so the uh, quantum community has been funded through all our, uh, um, our um, instruments for several years and we kind of took a, of a sample to check uh, with the uh, customized keyword study that how much we will actually have in our funded project uh, uh, quantum related researchers and we came up to the number around 100 that belong to the core and uh, several hundreds which are somewhere there loosely and now if we think about this core 100 and we give some uh, 20 projects per annually, so it, it goes millions uh, funds per year to this. So and one of these bottom-up instruments uh, is, uh, or the best one is the center of excellence uh, uh, instrument. And uh, Finland um, has started the center of excellence programs in the beginning of 2000, and those programs for, for six years uh, Center of Excellence programs has always been kind of a, a co-funding between uh, the funder, Academy of Finland, and then uh, the research host organization, and the uh, kind of the status of the Center of Excellence is then uh, attracting money from the other sources. So, in average, it's a third academy. Uh, uh, third from the host institution and third from other sources which includes company funding, um, uh, EU funding, uh, uh, foundations and so forth. So related to, uh, to quantum technology, we did have already in 2000 to 2005 uh, uh, closely related uh, center of excellence uh, and then um, uh, it was continued to 2006 to 2011 to be a more concrete on, on quantum technology. Uh, af after that, we evaluated the program and a little bit renewed. And uh, according to the new paradigm, we have the chosen the first, uh, first 12 uh, centers of excellence for eight years. And one of them is Quantum Technology Finland. And this uh, uh, center of excellence is now the national note to the uh, quantum community in this European uh, context. And this belongs, um, oh, one thing I want to say that, um, if you <laughs> want to rush that, um, uh, center of excellence, their task is also to be involved and develop infrastructures, and maybe that has also been the success of this quantum technology center of excellence because they have founded uh, 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 Otanano uh, uh, infrastructure, which is very important place for hundreds of researchers, but also for tens of, uh, of companies and uh, um, uh, in, in their practices, uh, the SMEs can just participate by hourly cost to this. They don't need to invest. So this is a kind of a ecosystem which is really exceeding. So we are happy to do that. This timing is very perfect with this European flagship and our center of excellence to continue for at least for five years and of that evaluation maybe for the rest of three years as well. Very good, thank you. Mr. Viola, can I ask you a question? You're sitting quietly, you too, because we didn't ask you much yet, but I did have a question. How, we heard that it takes 20 years to launch a flagship initiative, is that right? <laughs> How much discussion is, it, uh, is, is required uh, with the stakeholders at large, with the governments, with the research community, with the industry? What's the process? How long did it take, really, for the Commission to launch it? Uh, this one, the quantum flagship, it took two years uh, to launch it. And today, uh, this morning, we had the, uh, not the launch, the baby launch, of uh, a new one on the batteries of the future. So what will be energy storage in 2030? Uh, liquid batteries uh, or whatever, I mean. 
And so we started today, I mean, uh, and we hope to launch it the next year. So it takes from two years, this one is particularly complex, the quantum, but uh, normally it takes from one year to two years to launch it. Very good, so not that long. I'm going to change a little bit the format of the discussion here, okay? going to ask just a very simple question. Whoever wants to, to respond does respond, okay? So that we don't go through, uh, through all, of the, all of you one after the other. So quantum computers have existed for what, 40 years, I believe? Uh, quantum mechanics and physics, even more than that. So, uh, and we heard that there are already some applications in health or, or other sectors. What do you think? in terms of application is going to, next, is going to be the next uh, breakthrough for, for quantum technologies. Is there one example that you're using in your government, in your ministerial meetings, uh, ex to justify that, such an in that there is an investment needed in quantum technology? Do you want to give one example, uh, either at your country level or maybe at the European level? Who wants to give it a try? Well, if nobody uh, takes the floor, um, an example we use, and it's a worldwide used example for quantum computers, is uh, fertilizer. So uh, for the uh, production of food there in the agricultural sector, uh, uh, there's this Haber-Bosch process, and it's very energy consuming. It takes, I think... Uh, 3% or, well, I don't know the exact number, but it takes a lot of the energy uh, uh, in the world to have that process. And one could, with a quantum computer, uh, if, if with sufficient qubits, of course, one could run algorithms that could uh, simulate this molecule that exists in nature. And with that, it could be much more efficient and that could increase the food production and the efficiency of food production for the world tremendously. Very good. So that's a good example from the Netherlands. Is there another example that you're using in other countries? Minister Fassman. No. No, no. Start. You have difficult times in Germany now, please. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Minister. Now, I think I will maybe a broad example. I think we are all talking why is Google and other companies are spending so much money. And I think because we can, uh, with the di digital computers, we can uh, not solve any problems. As example, if you want to really uh, look through big data and you want to search and you want to find the minimum whatever, maybe if you have traffic or whatever, you cannot do it with a simple algorithm. You cannot say, as it says, very simple uh, uh, problems, optimizing problems, as a traveling and uh, a salesman problem, whatever. If you have a complex system, you cannot solve this. And what you said is perfect. The best is to, uh, if you want to um, simulate a quantum system, and we have quantum system all around, the best to simulate a quantum system is a quantum system. So I think there are hundreds of positive uh, examples, but I think I wanted to, I'm really interested, what is the Austrian and uh, example, because <laughs> you gave me the floor. Thank you, uh, Minister Fassmann. No, I, I learned from President Zeilinger, um, don't talk about your personal strategy, don't talk about the next disruptive technologies, because if you talk about it, will not be, you will not be the first one. That's clear. The others are waiting. What is your opinion? Um, I, I, I take the floor and take the microphone uh, without, without doing your job, but I would be interested in in getting answers to the following question. What is the relationship in your point of view between the quantum flagship initiative and what we call the mission-orientated research in Horizon Europe? So the, the, the relation between we building the next quantum computer, which is a promise and which is now discussed in Horizon Europe, and um, the relation to the quantum flagship, which is broader, which is much more bottom-up driven, that's clear, um, but there are some relation, or in another way around, what, is, what are your expectations concerning this mission, building the next quantum computer? 
on the technicality, should we ask Mr. Viola just to explain uh, the difference between the flagship and a mission, just in, in a few words. And then, indeed, I wanted to ask this from the different, uh, from the different countries. Mr. Viola. So missions uh, is a new concept that we presented in Horizon Europe. Uh, they are meant to uh, solve uh, big societal challenges. Like in medicine, uh, we are discussing the possibility to really solve uh, the problem of pediatric cancer. In uh, digitization, uh, the idea to, uh, to arrive to a quantum computer. So a little bit like in space, I mean, really going somewhere somewhere very, very challenging for the human being. That's the concept of mission. The concept of flagship in Horizon 2020, it's about uh, breaking new terrain in a particular technology challenge. So that's a big the difference. But that's going to overlap, right? Under Horizon Europe. The flagship, uh, and if there is a mission uh, for, what was it? It was a mission for the first universal uh, quantum computer. So... Well, one thing does not, does not exclude the other. I mean, no, okay. So the, the quantum flagship will continue under Horizon Europe. And then, I mean, uh, one of the objectives is also to have uh, this mission. And as I explained, quantum technologies are part of also the digital uh, Europe program, where we will do the real construction of infrastructure, quantum infrastructure. So. Uh, quantum flagship will multiply in the new uh, uh, financial framework. That's a bit the idea. Isn't, uh, isn't there a risk, I'm being a bit provocative here, but isn't there a risk to, uh, to spread too much the resources? Well, if you want, we can cut it. Eh? <laughs> if you <laughs> Make me the public <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure the audience will... Uh, no, I think, I think you have to consider there are three different dimensions of, of the problem. One is uh, uh, to continue the basic groundbreaking fundamental research on all quantum technologies. That's the quantum flagship. This will continue. Then there might be fallout, which are relatively practical, but not so practical that, I mean, pub private investment will just flow like this. Like today, we build supercomputers together with public money. Every, everyone in the world does it with public money. So this could be the case of a quantum key distribution system on a large scale, or could be a quantum accelerator which will be mounted on the next generation supercomputer. And then there's another dimension to do the big thing, the, the, the thing that will uh, break, I mean, uh, uh, change the world, and that's the quantum computer. So these are three different, completely different strands. If you don't do one of these three, the whole thing will fall apart. It's like the Philip Stark chair, which has three legs. If you cut one, you fall. Yeah. I Very hope I convinced. Good. Very good. So who wants to respond to the question of Minister Fastman? Director General Riesgo, why don't we start with you? Ladies first, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Our microphone. So, no, I, th I think this is uh, very relevant for the countries, and uh, we are very, very much uh, worried about this uh, issue. Yeah, um, particularly because uh, um, not not us, but particularly the, the the feedback that we have from the scientists and the researchers and the companies is that uh, we don't want to lose track in the future with the results that we are that we plan to get in these uh, initiatives as the, uh, the flagships, yeah? I mean, um, so uh, what, the, um, what, uh, what we have heard here is, I think it's interesting that it's a, a three different scales or three different legs in the, for, for the chair, yeah? Uh, to, to be standing up. And I think this is uh, very interesting. Um, I say from, from our point of view, there could be some doubts in, uh, in, in that. One thing is, uh, it's very, uh, it's very uh, hard to say the first uh, uh, quantum computer that we know that there are some others that are looking forward to that, yeah, one thing. Um, there could be uh, um, something that have, is more inclusive in the, in the sense of the technologies, including communications, for example, or the future 
I say the quantum internet or something like that, that include computers, include uh, partially the communications and also partially the sensors for doing a kind of an internet of things or something like that. So from our point of view, we think that is, uh, what is very important is that the uh, continuous results, the scientific and technical results of the, of the flagship does not fall into something that is, has not continuation in Horizon Europe. I understand that this is also very important for That's the mission. That's a very that important uh, point. Yes, indeed. So hold on. We had Director General Lucas first, and Mr. <coughs> Bourgoin, and then, so here first, Mr. Lucas first. I think it's a very, very difficult uh, situation. First of all, I would say we have, we had a great impact by the um, flagship. So I think we should stay with the flagship and, bro uh, and stay with a broad approach. Because I, let me quote, I think we had a quote here about the telephone. But I think this was, uh, I think this was, I think a finance man who uh, uh, said, who had doubts about the telephone. Let me quote uh, 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 Ken Olsen, who was founder uh, of digital equipment, and he said in the 1977, so I was, I was 20 years old, he said there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. And this was a man who was knowing everything about computers. And I have a lot of other quotes. So I would say be very, very careful to start a mission too early, but be very careful to start it just a little too late because first we need, I think, we need the scientists, uh, uh, nach, we have to need basic research. We have to, have to need competence. Competence means we have, need the right people and we have to go into the communication, what you called uh, quantum internet. We have to go uh, to the sensors and we have to go step by step a little into the computers. But saying now we want to have a quantum computer of, uh, in a certain stage, I think it's a really interesting question. And we should stay with this question and maybe I'm, we are open for this mission. But it couldn't be instead because I can say you everything about the history of science. I can nothing say about the future of science. What I really know, we will use the technology, but I know, don't know how. We have never known how a technology will be used. We have only thought about the potential. So I would say let go ahead with the, um, go ahead with the, with, with our broad approach, which I call it flagship. You can call it different, but it's the right approach. And be very careful if you have the competence in industry. If industry, uh, not, I think, it in, in, is interested. So it's not about competence of individual people. It's competence, we've, if we talk about a computer, competence of industry. And we had a representative of industry. And if he says, I have a plan, I c stay with a the plan, then let's take this mission. I think then is right. But if you have nobody who is really investing from industry, then don't, don't go the way and stay with the flagship. So I think we should do, go both ways. And I, I know that the commission will be so intelligent to see how, how, how the industry will work. But we should not stay only with industry-led programs. We should have both scientific-oriented programs and industry-led programs and a mixture step-by-step. Step. OK. We go to Mr. Bourguin, then. <laughs> yes, I am particularly agree with uh, Mrs. Riesco, um, but uh, not uh, only with her. Uh, I, uh, I think that uh, quantum flagship uh, must continue, must go on, and must be heavily financed. Uh, and uh, uh, in parallel can run uh, quantum computer, uh, quantum computing that uh, uh, can be enlarged, uh, for example, with uh, quantum communication. I think that uh, uh, these are two roles that uh, uh, must be uh, run uh, together. Monsieur Bourgoin. Thank you. Well, um, we are very comfortable with the idea that, uh, first of all, for the, the flagship has to be secured for the future because what has been built is really very valuable. Um, it has to prove that it's, um, 
let's say, progressing in a way where with, with which uh, the, the scientists on the one end and the, the technologists on the other end uh, work together. And, and this, has to, this has been built over the last two uh, years, and this has to, to go on and de de deliver and, and demonstrate. So this is something we consider as, as a must to uh, go on with the flagship, uh, with, with its broader approach and its governance. That said, uh, the issue of the mission, for me, it's, a, it's in a different space. Uh, it's, it's in a space where uh, we can convince our, uh, our citizens in Europe that attacking the most difficult scientific and technological challenge is something that Europe is capable to do. And I think that a quantum computer um, is one of these very few examples uh, where it's possible with some, um, some effort some some pedagogy uh, uh, it's it's possible to explain this and uh, be sure that uh, science is recognized as a societal challenges in Europe and this is very important for us um, um, as well and the, and the last point I would like to mention is that having a very very difficult goal is is always something very motivating uh, for for the young people for the young talents and this community is already with a lot of young talents, but if we uh, put on top of the flagship uh, a mission like the one uh, we're talking about, uh, I bet we will attract the best tal talents in Europe and help them stay in Europe. So that's another additional reason why we think a mission on top of the flagship would be uh, the, the most um, appreciated solution. Good. Very good. Very good. So State Secretary Stromayer, you wanted to add something, and then I'll come to either one of you. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me stress that from the beginning, Slovenia supported the flagships as an instrument to solve the grand scientific and technological challenges with high potentials to boost the competitive advantage of the European economy and significantly improve the life of European citizens. We believe that they should be a combination of a bottom-up approach identifying the ambitious long-term challenges and of a top-down approach securing large R&D investments coordinated at the EU and the national level. Uh, we would like to draw the attention to the importance of the openness of the flagship instrument to new partners during the life cycle as its nature and development from pioneering research towards development of future projects, uh, products and services is very important. It's also important to welcome also smaller research organizations with particular competences and not only to bigger organizations with large research infrastructure. As already expressed at different occasions, Slovenia is convinced that in, the Europe, that in the Horizon Europe, the ratio among science, development and innovation should stay as it is in the present Horizon 2020 and therefore flagship instruments should also be an important part of the emerging Horizon Europe. And on a personal level, just let me add that I'm convinced that Europe needs to fully and on a large scale invest in research, development and innovations and that we should aim for the moon because even if we miss, we'll end up in the stars. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Ambassador Moore, you wanted to add something. I'll come to you uh, right after also because Romania's presidency is coming. <laughs> Please, Ambassador Moore. Yeah, thank you. Just, just coming back to the point, uh, the flagship in the context of your uh, Horizon Europe, uh, as, you, as you asked. And I would li very much like to uh, echo what my German colleague said. I think Horizon Europe will put quite some emphasis on innovation. Mm -hmm. On innovation. Uh, but we must not forget that innovative ideas emanating from excellent fundamental research are an indispensable ingredient of any, any innovation. So we cannot make a difference between innovation and fundamental research. Both goes together. And uh, that's what, what we in our country are very, very proud of. Uh, we have up to now a very, very research friendly parliament. And as long as the bottom up principle is granted, all these ideas coming from bottom up, then 
more or less nobody will ask in the parliament w what are the, 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 the points coming up in, in, in two, three years. As long as it is part of the innovation, we are fine. Very good. State Secretary Preda, I wanted to come to you because Minister Fassman has been taking note probably for the next meeting with Commissioner Moedas to discuss the five missions, but right after Austria, the, 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 the Romanian presidency of the EU is coming up, so you'd have your share of discussions as well, so what, what do you think? Uh, thank you. Yes, indeed, we have uh, two more months and uh, we'll take it over, so I'm looking forward no to, <laughs> to do it properly and to not being late. <laughs> so, yeah, two more months, yeah. <laughs> this is what I said, yeah. I know exactly, I'm counting the days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I uh, take the opportunity to have uh, Mr. Viola uh, right next to me, and uh, actually I do have a simple question. Uh, <clears throat> of course, I, I'm supposed to give an answer, but uh, you can this, also this is what I learned in politics, time. whenever you are, you have to answer, you have to put another question, because, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, from your point of view, uh, w in which place do you think that we are more competitive? Uh, whenever we talk about high-performance computer or whenever we talk about quantum computer? Because from my point of view, and uh, we do have a list of, uh, of uh, people working in, in this area, uh, we say that uh, with respect to the high-performance computer, we're, we are supposed to deliver a pre-exascale, I guess, by 2020 and the full exascale by 2022, 23, uh, meaning 10 to 17 floating points, which is a lot. Uh, computation per, per second. <laughs> uh, so here, I mean, when we talk about high performance computer, we are some, I mean, the competition is really, really strong. We are somehow behind United States or China. We have to, to catch up a lot. When we talk about quantum computer and more exactly to quantum computing, which is a theory, then things are in the very beginning and uh, definitely Europe is extremely competitive uh, with respect to United States and China. So I think from my point of view, uh, and not only my point of view, I think we should emphasize uh, definitely uh, on the places where we are competitive, uh, more competitive than, uh, you know, with I mean comparing with, uh, with other places where we have to catch up. Because uh, uh, with respect to high performance computer and Romania signed up the, the, the declaration uh, to adhere to the hyper Euro HPC, High Performance uh, Computing Initiative, and I'm happy for that. Uh, with respect to that one, we have, we have to catch up and our competitors are definitely, uh, they, uh, they did well. Uh, and they have a history already with respect to that subject. With respect to quantum technologies, I think we are extremely competitive and we can, uh, we can obtain a good position uh, on the run, on the long run. Uh, <coughs> regarding your question, uh, as an example, I, I wrote here, I think we have two examples of, uh, I mean, graphene and human brain projects are two examples of flagships that establish Europe as a leader in research innovation domain, attracting the best minds all over the world and creating the skillful and multidisciplinary research environment Europe needs. The flagships invite everyone to participate and to interconnect. The choices we make have an impact. We are provided with a sense of how to work together in small groups, but is beyond our understanding the idea that our action could somehow affect the whole planet. The member states expect to change this approach of solving societal challenges and to embrace an unprecedented potential offered by quantum technologies. Uh, <clears throat> one more thing and I'll, uh, I'll, give, I'll pass the floor to someone else. So, for instance, uh, someone uh, uh, said uh, about keeping uh, the, I mean, uh, keeping the emphasis on fundamental research. I'm, as I said, uh, nobody's perfect, <laughs> I'm a mathematician, but, <laughs> uh, so I definitely, I, I do empathize with, uh, with fundamental research. But creating this combination, I mean, <clears throat> the link between innovation and fundamental research, for instance, in my country is difficult to, difficult to attain. As you know, Romania has a very strong tradition in, uh, tradition in fundamental research, especially mathematics, physics, chem, and so on. But with respect to innovation, at least with respect to innovation scoreboard, we are not on a fantastic uh, position. Actually, uh, we are on the last one. Uh, so, uh, from this point of view, we struggle, we struggle with respect to innovation, we really struggle to, 
to, I don't know, to speed up the things and to try to catch up and to see exactly what we do wrong, because definitely we do something wrong. For instance, th this is a habit of people which are doing fundamental research. We are unable to monetize the value of our research. Commissioner Moedas, if I remember correctly, said something like, we are all able to do research out of, out of Euro, but very few of us are able to do Euro back out of research. So this is the problem, for instance, in, in my country, and we do struggle to solve it or to find a, a solution. And regarding the New Horizon Europe, I just want to quote Einstein, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Thank you. Yeah, we have two more, uh, two, two more comments here. Then you'll have to tell us if you're happy with the answers. That was your question. <laughs> but hold on, here. Yes. Please, for me yes, to, uh, to conclude my reflections, uh, I think that uh, uh, the ability to share uh, information uh, informations, uh, safely and freely is the heart of uh, democracy. Um, quantum communication uh, can give this ability to all European citizens. Uh, that is uh, why yeah, I think, because I think that uh, uh, we should enlarge uh, uh, quantum uh, computing and uh, involving uh, quantum communication. This is uh, very important uh, for uh, um, democracy and for uh, Europe, uh, for all our citizens, I think. Very good. We'll come back, uh, we'll come back to that. Mr. Barbosa. <coughs> May I just make a, a small comment? I, 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 I really think that quantum is something very mobilizing to society. And it's some, something that we can build awareness in our population. I completely agree with, with, with what you said before. But I was, uh, um, uh, when you're talking, I was remembering uh, um, a scene of, um, of, of a movie from the late uh, 70s by Woody Allen, which most of the present must know, in which at certain point um, a person asks, uh, uh, says, uh, yeah, the, the answer is yes, but would you mind to repeat the question? And I think the, 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 the real aim of these uh, programs is to help Europe to articulate the right questions uh, in the triple dimension of uh, the scientific dimension, the societal dimension, the economic dimension. Because in, in the end of the day, what we are actually building is a society, um, knowledge-based society, which is actually able to produce to, 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 to make more euros out of the research, but also to provide uh, a, a sustainable way of living to our citizens and a, a, a more inclusive society in, in the end of the day. So that's so. Very good, thank you. Ms. Latinen, you also wanted to come in. Um, thank you. So um, I can really agree with that, that uh, quantum flagship should be continued as a flagship because technology needs a long long term uh, uh, support i know the basic science should be all all along all along there with and to form the a very uh, fruitful ecosystem with the, with the in the industry part but one thing what what might be in in the horizon europe the suggestion for the uh, infrastructure part in pillar 1 is the funding is rather low so maybe this could be considered a little bit enhanced in the context also for the, the quantum technology to have, have funding also for infrastructures there. Okay, important point as well. What are your takeaways from all this contribution, Minister Fassmann? Yeah, first I have to say thank you for the contribution. Um, I will discuss your opinion with Commissioner Moidas when we have the next opportunity. I feel that we have, that we see the complementarity of the different um, initiatives. So the quantum flagship initiative is a bottom-up driven um, initiative. It's long lasting. Um, it's much more orientated to curiosity driven research, whereas the mission is established to solve a very specific issue. Um, pediatric cancer or to build a universal quantum computer. So there is, a, there is an intelligent 
um, division of labor function, there is complementarity of both. Therefore, I agree um, that this is not a competition between, th this is one helps the other one. And this is, this is exactly, I think, what we should do um, to strengthen the scientific community in the quantum field and um, the mission is orientated to very specific to very specific field. So, good story, told very short, and I bring it to the to to our negotiations concerning Horizon Europe. Thank you. Very good. Uh, I have one question because something that came back uh, several times is the need to, to communicate to citizens, and I just wanted to ask about the link between quantum technologies and social sciences. What do you think? is the importance of social sciences in bringing the citizens, it's the, um, well, the, the society at large into the debate. And what do they need to understand? And do you have any specific initiatives to go and talk to the people, either in Europe or in, in your countries? Mr. Viola. Thank you. I owe you a quick answer. So you ask me whether I like Carbonara or socket port. So whether I like supercomputing or quantum computing. When I reorganized the G-Cornet, I put them together in the same group, which is headed by Thomas. And one of the animators of the quantum community told me, I hope he will repeat it today, so I will, he will stay anonymous, he said he. Roberto, it's a great idea, you should do it. So I'm convinced that uh, the future of supercomputing will progressively uh, use quantum elements. I mean, the speed of it, we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, time will tell. But uh, I'm super convinced that whoever works in advanced uh, high performance computing has to work end in end with whoever works in quantum technology. So that's why in my group they work together. So on, on uh, the um, uh, issue of communication, I heard many times the argument of curiosity. Now, the day I became a bureaucrat, I was working still as a scientist in the European Space Agency, and someone told me, look, space is a luxury for mankind. Now we cannot afford it anymore. As you know, in the last 30 years, the space program all over the world has slowed down considerably after the Apollo mission, the rest, uh, uh, for many reasons, we have slowed down considerably. And I think we paid collectively as human beings a price for it. Uh, I think quantum is not a luxury. Quantum is not even, uh, a, yes, of course, scientific research and innovation are out of curiosity, chance, uh, uh, so you can never predict. But I think citizens should understand uh, that this is really about their future life. Maybe not immediately, but that's something that will change their life. Uh, now, some scientists told me, well, you, Roberto, don't overpromise, because then if the quantum flagship doesn't deliver, then people will start to say, you see, it's the usual scene that, I mean, you play the drum and nothing comes out. No, of course, it, it has to be a long, a difficult journey with pain, uh, tears, and probably, I mean, some failures. But clearly, this is uh, not just simply curiosity, this is something that will deliver a, a, an effective change of quality of life. That's why it deserves the status of a mission. But this does not change the fact that we need to continue working also on all the rest of uh, the ecosystem, the quantum ecosystem. Very good. Would anyone like to add anything on the need to communicate to citizens? You've already touched upon it a little bit, but yeah. And then I would take a couple of questions from the audience, so be really quick in raising your hand. I Two. think first of all, I would say it's about, I think we should talk about also when we to use this technology, of course we can use this for larger data, and then we can use this in combination with artificial intelligence and other. And then I think it's really uh, not a question of ethics. And I think uh, my statement for this is, if we, uh, nach, if we only talk about ethics, we will not come to us, uh, nach, we will not uh, make any progress. But if we don't talk about it, then we get lost. 
So I would say it's very, very important uh, not only to say about what is could be the positive outcome, so also to talk about what could be the negative outcome. I think politicians are have to say two things. We will give money to achieve this, but we will fight strongly against this. I make a clear, easy example of from artificial, uh, artificial intelligence. We don't, in, I think in Europe, want to use this to spy our citizens. We will not use this and we will fight against this, both also with intelligence, also with artificial intelligence against this way. So it's not what is, uh, other countries are doing. And our thing in Europe is not that we think that uh, I think uh, these technologies should be in one, uh, in some hands of only some uh, companies and they take them uh, and, and, and the winner takes it all. This is also not the, our philosophy in Europe. So I think we should say, where is our way? What is our democracy? How we want to uh, use these technologies? But we should really say, we want to use it, but we want to use it in a certain direction. And this direction is not only a thing which a government uh, is deciding. I think, therefore, we, as example, we had in, in Germany, uh, nach, uh, I think, a parliament group which is now talking about uh, uh, nach, uh, the way of uh, for artificial intelligence, ethics, and uh, what it should be the politics, enquete commission. So I would say this is the right way. This is uh, nach, uh, has to be discussed in parliaments, of course. Members of uh, the the, uh, the the governments are sometimes also members of a parliament, but it's uh, and we have to discuss this with the citizen. When I'm in, in such an audience, I always tell the German colleague, sorry, I say, look at the list of the members of this enquete commission and look at, and look at the addresses. Send them emails. Say I'm here. I know something. I want to participate, and this is how it should be. So it's not only to explain it to people. They are not children but really invite to dis uh, in a discussion, and the discussion is a discussion with people in parliament and not only between government and citizens so that government is explaining citizens, this is good for you. I would say, this is what they would say, this was what mom and dad was also saying, and that's not the pos position of a government. It better, I would say, that the citizens also are saying what they want, and they don't want uh, some situations we have in China and some situations we have in the United States. They want to have built up a Europe. And the last s sentence, I would say, what I don't understand sometimes, that the people think they could live without, without a strong Europe, without a strong European Commission. Without this Commission, I think we, we are lost. I think uh, nach, uh, we were lost because I think we have to have an advocate in the world who is saying, no, who is going to Trump and saying, oh, we are stronger than you, believe us. We are the biggest market. Europe is the biggest market in the world. Maybe after China, this depends on statistics, but it's not in the United States. So I would say if we want to have also our values brought and uh, live our values in Europe, we have to be strong, And but the values are not, not, not always the same. We should discuss what are our values for the future? And this is diffi very difficult in the community, very difficult in Germany. And we had election in one of our lender. Okay. Very difficult. Thank you. And so bureaucrat matter, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, I, can I add that Europe is not a, a ghost? Well then, I'm just going to free up because I think Mr. Valditara needs to go. So I was I told that you would need to go at five. So thank you very much. The others stay thank here. You. We'll take a couple of questions. Thank you for this uh, very interesting and stimulating thank debate. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks again. Please. Mr. Viola. I'll simply to to say that, I mean, Europe is not a ghost that goes around and say, this is me, this is Europe. Europe is all of us, all of us in this room, together, doing new things for the benefit of everyone. So thank you very much for this. Good. Two questions. Who is the fastest? Here we have one. Yeah, but let's remember this. Eh? So you start. Oh, hello. So, uh, my name is Radio Nichoyu. I'm the uh, QCN uh, member for Romania. And uh, I think we discuss a lot about um, opportunities in Europe and the fact that we don't want to create uh, to speed Europe with the fast countries and uh, slow countries. Uh, so, my question is how do we make sure that 
we help the uh, slower countries to develop uh, quantum technologies and not to lag behind. Thank you. Good, simple, important question. Who would like to answer? I think you need to... to, to so, who, Minister Fassman first? No, or, you raised a very serious issue. What we call this, the widening aspect or the the, the, the gap aspects. Um, in the proposal of the Commission concerning Horizon Europe, there is, I think, um, the, the, the money for these activities are, are, is, is tripled to support um, the EU 13 countries in developing their scientific um, system. Um, because it, it's clear if there is a growing disparity within the European research area, that's a very unhealthy situation for the whole European scenery. So your point is right, and we, we should address it, we have addressed it, and we should try to, to, to make this gap smaller. Yes, State Secretary Pedra. So it's gonna be a conversation between Romanians. Uh, so I, I think I'm not the one which should address the question, but uh, let me just add something. So as you know, in the new, in the new framework of Horizon, I mean in the new Horizon Europe framework, we have to address, we try to address the research and innovation divide, which actually speaks about what you, what you raised over here. And I think, uh, I think Honorable Nika already pointed out some, uh, some uh, solutions. Uh, what I wanna say is that all over the place is the key word is cohesion, only in research the key word is excellence. So somehow we try to interconnect the two words to say something like excellence in cohesion or cohesion in excellence. That's, uh, <laughs> that's something which I wanted to add, keeping at a metaphorical level. Thank you. Any other comments on widening? Another question from the audience? No, this is your last chance. Yes, yes. Okay, we take these last two questions and then we wrap up. Um, Paolo Bianco, Airbus. Um, I would like to ask uh, if you have started in your countries the uh, political discussion, as it was said before, in order to actually come up with the directions to set up laws on how to better use uh, the technologies that we are about uh, to generate. Um, Without laws, there's no certainties on the use and the applications of the technologies and uh, the realization of products. Um, and it is a component that we need and uh, we need to start the soonest. Thank you. One final question from here, I think. Well, you, you also wanted to ask a question, right? I yeah, have uh, one question uh, related to, let's say, the difference between what we are discussing here, eh? whether this is fundamental science or how far we can already push it to an application, that is the bottom-up approach, and at the other hand, hopefully in the end we have uh, industry waiting. But there's probably a gap in between where you just need a bunch of hardcore engineering. And you already pointed out, uh, you know, in Romania we are very good at the basic science, but what then? And the what then question is you need also the hardcore, let's say, electrical engineering IC designers. I think in general you can say in Europe we are not very strong in those kind of things. That is where we lack as compared to a lot of other countries. So how do you see the, in your policy also this step beyond? Let's say we are successful with the basic concepts, the prototyping. Can we then actually scale it up or not? Do we have to research the engineering research, etc., in place? Thank you. Who would like to respond? Fekke, we start. Uh, well, I think at Europe we shouldn't be too modest about our own capabilities because I think we have a very strong uh, uh, excellence in science, but we also do have a very strong excellence in engineering. There we have great companies in Germany, but you know, at, at a lot of places where big engineering activities take place. And I think if we combine these 
uh, strengths, uh, we are uh, capable of a lot of things. And we have shown that in the past, we've shown that now, we, we're showing it, and I think uh, it's just not true that we say, oh, we can only do the science, and then, oh, well, the other parts of the world will take it up and bring it to the market. No, we can do that in Europe. And I think we should build upon this flagship, uh, make it grow, and on top of it, really start uh, uh, focused efforts for this engineering uh, activity. Mr. Lucas. Yeah, I think first sometimes we think that basic research and innovation are far apart. Uh, if you take disruptive innovations, then they're very close, and we have sometimes difficulty with this. So I would say if the way is through engineering, I think then Europe has a really big, uh, a great possibility. But we should also keep into mind sometimes uh, the step from r basic research to innovation is a very, very short disruptive innovation. I think where you have an, uh, an, an inv invention where you really can, I think, um, where you, where an old business model is collapsing immediately. So I would say we should also keep a, a, an eye on this and therefore I'm also, also always finding for basic research but because the series has first basic research and applied research and so on, this is an old theory, never proven, that's all people talking about, but this is not the truth. There's one step from basic, Einstein's idea, Einstein's idea, now uh, uh, his, his talk about the twins who are traveling in, uh, in, one is staying here, one is traveling around and they come back together and see that their watches are uh, different. So one, uh, not the one who stays is always getting older and the other not that far older. So I think we use this in our satellites and this is only a thought. And then you need sometimes engineering, but sometimes the thought could be directly if you have all the uh, engineering part, if you have all the possibilities and you can use it immediately so be very careful sometimes you have an idea and you have to wait Einstein well he had the idea and we had to wait for, for the technology but sometimes you can have a great idea in basic research and you have all the technology and you can use it immediately and that means basic research one step to innovation we should not only think about only the the long as so, so I think in Europe we, are, we always start with engineering and so go 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 but we should also think uh, maybe basic research, one step in innovation. I think when we s look in other countries, in, in Israel and others, they do sometimes this way, and we should take also the shortcut. Good, thank you. Monsieur Bourgoin, and then no. you want to have the final Yes, uh, thank you. Just um, with respect to the question that was uh, posed uh, about uh, laws, um, well, the, the only possible answer, in my opinion, is that we have to anticipate. First of all, we're talking about technology here. We're not talking about application. Laws are usually about uh, regulation of applications, not necessarily regulating the technology itself. But the only way to anticipate, and it will be back to the question you asked before, um, it, it's about involving right from the start uh, s social and human uh, scientists. And this is something I think would be very valuable while we are, for the most part, still on the uh, technology side rather than already on the application side. And this would probably help. The other way with which uh, a law can, can be properly defined on new uh, grounds is by experiment experimenting. And there are some laws um, in, in at various places, if I'm correct, in Europe, at least there is one in France, um, where uh, sandboxes are possible for experimenting. And this is another answer to this, to this case that may sometime, I hope in the not too distant future, future apply for uh, quantum technologies. Ambassador Moore, but Just one sentence, place. don't come up too early with laws. They will take away the oxygen from the researchers. Coming back to your first, to the first speaker, um, with great amusement, I remember when we stayed some days in Singapore, and they told us with pride that they now start to install um, and build up 
street lamps, and on the street lamps are cameras, and all movements of all people with their faces will be recorded. Um, and they said, this is a wonderful idea to make, um, how I can say, security in our society. And I came back to that, what you said. Um, there is, this is a complete different world to Germany, France, Netherlands, or Austria. Um, we would say, are the people crazy what they are doing? Um, so therefore, <coughs> you, you raised the question, when the explanation should start um, when introducing um, new technology, or you ask what, what is the duty of social scientists to explain new te technology, and it's a great importance. And therefore, this is not a real um, um, suggestion for me, but you should reserve some percentage of the money for communication, for PR activities, to explain to people what you are doing and why you need um, the taxpayers' money. Um, to, to avoid um, false expectations and frustrations from every side. Roberto Viola, the final word is yours. Oh my God. <laughs> well, uh, quickly I react on this uh, point about uh, how quick uh, the innovation should come uh, into something real and uh, what we should do. With an example, uh, uh, again in space, uh, you are familiar with the concept of solar wind, which is one of uh, uh, the proof that, I mean, uh, radiation has uh, also the power, the physical impact on objects. Now, a colleague uh, came with the idea of solar sailing and solar flaps. So they were added to satellites, little flaps, like in the plane, and this saved a lot of fuel on telecommunication satellite. So this, I mean, comes from fundamental physics and uh, the innovation came quite quickly. Now we have created here, I mean, a community, an ecosystem, thanks to the community, not thanks to us, of ideas, innovation about quantum, and we are creating in the new framework two instruments which are complementary that allow, I mean, once there's something that really can, can become concrete, I think about the internet of quantum, then we have the possibility to realize it. I mean, this was a bit missing in uh, the present uh, system where it seems like you have to research forever. Yes, you should continue research forever, but also you should have an instrument to actually come very quickly into the engineering and implementation field. But uh, to, to come back where we started, this is a festivity of celebrating the quantum uh, flagship. So may I thank you, Minister for hosting us and for all the work that be, has been done and especially thank all the quantum community for the fantastic achievement and all the colleagues from the member states because we all support, I think you heard it, so I can say for all of us, we support it all utterly. So thank you very much. A long vive to the quantum flagship. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. I think you've done an amazing job, although uh, there were, we were quite a few, uh, you, you were quite a few on stage, but I hope you all managed to, uh, to, say, to give your messages. So again, please join me in thanking the, all the speakers. As you wish, if you want to stay on stage, we will have a final uh, piece uh, of music. And stay with us. There will be a final piece, a final bit of celebration right after, right after a composition by Django Reinhardt called Rhythm Future.
so ladies and gentlemen, now is the moment to start the flagship, right? And so, well, first of all, I would like to, of course, to thank again the, uh, the musicians for all the music they have done with us. Really amazing, yes. <clears throat> So now we had a lot of brainstorms. How do we start this flagship? Of course, it must be something quantum. We want to impress, after all, all these uh, VIPs here on stage. And so we started thinking, OK, maybe we could have like a, a ribbon cutting via a laser. Yeah? And then maybe a hammer falls on some, uh, I don't know, dewar full with uh, liquid nitrogen. And then we started asking, I don't know, the fire brigade you know, about uh, lasers cutting ribbons. Hmm, not good. OK, so then we thought, OK, we are in the hometown of the Schrodinger's cat. And many people said that, starting with Anton today. And uh, well, and then there might be some issues about animal protection, stuff like that. So then, uh, well, we had to converge onto something practical. But we wanted something real. So there are two real things. One is a very big, fat, red button, which our minister and our director general will push. And what will happen is, well, I mean, maybe just some video thing. But the exciting real part is we want a real Schrodinger cat. So it cannot be a cat. So the first thing I did is I got a real PhD student and a real entrepreneur, a real quantum entrepreneur. So <coughs> Carlos Avellan from Barcelona. <laughs> and this is real because the fact is we want to start the flagship, you know, but it is a quantum flagship. And as it has been said, we are in the hometown of the Schrodinger cat. So, I mean, we asked the cat. And, you know, the cat is in a superposition. Should we start the flagship? Should we maybe not? So he will decide. He will collapse. Maybe yes, maybe no. So if you do one measurement, not good, you know, because we have 50-50% chance of being able to start the flagship. So what we did is we got a real Schrodinger cat, a real quantum random number generator, this thing is a real quantum random number generator commercialized by this guy. And please, can you tell us who you are? Sure, thanks. So I'd like to tell a very brief story. So I remember the first time I got into this building was three years ago. And actually, it was in the basement of this chasm. It was an experiment that was being done by in the group of Anton Zeilinger. It was a fantastic experiment. <coughs> so I was a PhD student at TICFO in Barcelona at that time. Uh, together with my, with my colleagues, we had the chance to build a tailor-made device that was using the experiment. And that was a great experience. So we, we I personally learned a lot about engineering, about physics, but very importantly about how powerful collaboration can be, right? So working with other people in the same field. But today I'm here as a co-founder of QSight, which is a spin-off company in Barcelona too. And I'm very humbled of being here, actually. And the nice thing is that with Tommaso, again, we had the chance to build a tailored-made device for an experiment in the Hofburg building. That's what we're going to be doing now. So this is what this device is doing. Actually, it's a device that's going to try to tell us something. And it's doing it by throwing, using the loss of quantum mechanics, the randomness of quantum mechanics, to put letters at random. And we'll try to get some meaning out of there. Right? So we'll see. Let's see what it has to say. So normally, you would say, in such a case, do not try this at home, right? for insurance purposes, but no, you can try this at home. You just have to buy this thing. And so this thing will emit a string of random bits by measuring many, many Schrodinger cats. Some of them will be alive, some of them will be dead. And this long string of bits, sometimes, you know, some ASCII uh, letters, some sequences for binary sequences for letters will come up. And we hope that after some measurements, the cat will be able to tell us that the flagship should begin. So I would like to summon here uh, the minister and our director general to come here so that they are ready. And as soon as the cat will allow us, they can push the big fat red button and have the flagship begin. So now there is nothing on the, on, oh yes, yes, yes. So there is a prompt, you know, it is a little bit uh, the matrix style here. So um, we see now the, the cat will start. Let's see what will be the outcome, yes? And please be ready, because when the cat will say we can do something, then we should be quick to push with a big click the red button. Please. Oh, wow. OK, so it worked. And then now we push it.
So we are there. Welcome to the quantum future. Was it really random? <laughs> So, and with this, uh, I would like to conclude the day. Maybe there is uh, some word from the presidency. Do we, we did not schedule that, okay. So I will thank the presidency. I will thank all the participants uh, to this uh, round table. I will thank all the speakers of this day. I will thank all of you for being here, for still being such an alive community. And tomorrow we have another long day ahead of us for more work, for more input to give to the commission and to our governments. So now enjoy the drinks uh, and see you tomorrow. <laughs>